You knew it was coming. Needed to get that out. I had to hold that in my house of sleeping angels last night. Couldn't get it out until just now. It feels so good, so cathartic. Welcome to the program, everybody. Ben and Woods, 97.3, The Fan. Just phenomenal to be here with you this morning. Uh, I'm Woodsy. That's Paul Rindle, the executive producer. Good morning, Paulie. Good morning. Benjamin Higgins, your friendly neighborhood sports anchor. Mr. Glass Half Full joins us as well. How's your glass? Overfloweth, doesn't it? Even my glass had started to um, get down to the quarter level at some point. <laughs> <laughs> there's like a, there's like a one huh. swallow left. Yeah, there's just not a lot in this glass tonight. I'm gonna really, I am going to really have to savor those last drops because that that ain't half full anymore. You know, like when you're laying in bed and you have a water bottle or something next to you, you're like, there's literally a swallow in that. I'm gonna savor that thing till maybe I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I need a pull off of it. I'm not Ooh. getting out of bed to go. Fill it with delicious, mineral-enhanced eco-water. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to wait. Holy crap, you guys. What a what a game last night. I, I mean. I love because we have people waking up in the chat who probably set their alarm for 6 o'clock who went to bed at maybe at 8.45, 9 last night, not having any idea what we are talking about right now. It is the San Diego Padres. I can't stand you guys sometimes. Holy cow. I mean. It's that, it's that love like you have for your kids. <laughs> You're just like, I love you so much, but you are the worst. You're the worst. Like, just one of those games, man. I'll never forget that game. One of the best games I've ever watched. Period. The end. The 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 range of emotions that I felt, Ben. You'd be very proud of me. I could have gotten us in a severe amount amount of. I would have gotten a stern talking to from our boss Adam Klug for what I wanted to tweet last night down eight nothing. I think we should just issue a complete forgiveness, like the the Pope can do. Yeah, just just like a papal forgiveness to everyone who tweeted something mean on social media last night when it was eight nothing. That gave up on the season. That said, it's all over. I can't believe this team. You're forgiven. We're all just moving on yeah. and enjoying the nine run comeback last night to beat the Cubs nine to eight. Because yes, that is exactly what happened. Padres scored seven runs in the sixth inning, and then Fernando Tatis Jr. hit the go ahead two run home run with two outs in the bottom of the eighth. Oh. And then Robert Suarez came in and is what said just uncorked. The hardest fastballs he could on every pitch in the ninth inning to lock down the save. My man walked out to the mound, just unzipped his pants, and was like, here it is. Here's 14 of them. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just, here it is. Hit it. No nibbling. They no. always say, oh, yeah, big league hitters. Yeah, they can oh, hit a fastball. They're ready. They can, they can catch up to that. No, no, they couldn't. Dude, no nibbling. No, oh, I'm going to paint this. Ooh, let me try to fool him here. Just, here it is. Here's 14 of them. Do your worst. I I got goosebumps thinking about it, man. Watching that last K, I got up. I had two kids asleep. My wife dead asleep next to me. I got out of bed and was doing the, this. <laughs> Screaming silently. The silent scream and the fist pumps. I did get a touch emotional uh, when Tatis hit that home run. It was just like, it was, I can't, you know, everybody knows how much they needed that win. And everybody knows how much. The fan base needed that win. I don't know how much it's going to change. I'd certainly love for this to be the game that you look to and say, man, this is when they said, we believe. And when the city said, we believe. Those those weird things happen in sports. Rarely 13 games into a season, right? <laughs> like, I don't think they're going to rip off 30 games, 30 wins in a row. It'd be awesome if they did. But, man, just to know you can be – out, you know, down but not out was pretty cool. I, we just have not seen that from these guys, yeah, I, man. I, I'm the first one who's going to say, don't make too much of one game, For sure. however great or however bad it is. But there is a there's a real thing, a cloud that's been hanging over this team since last season. And if anything can kind of push a cloud like that away, it's a game like last night. It's a confidence builder, no doubt about it. You had some guys who really needed to have big swings, like Xander Bogarts come through. Hassan uh, Kim, and, huge yeah, knock. And, and Tatis doing what he did, having your star 
actually deliver in a moment where it looked like it was going to be one of those, man, they fought back so far and they got to 8-7 and then they got some bad luck in the seventh where they had two two walks and runners on and they scorched two balls yep. and right into gloves. It's like, uh, this, we know how this is going to end. They're going to lose this, aren't they? They're going to fight all the way back and they're going to lose it 8-7. to seven. To come through with the two outs is something we didn't see last year. We saw it. It reminded me of uh, Juan Soto nearly hitting the grand slam. Oh and my I thought, god, oh, man! Yeah, Tatis's ball is going to die. It's a warning god. track, right? <laughs> it's going to. They're going to jump over the wall and bring it back. But they didn't. It wasn't his longest home run ever. Nope. But it got over the fence this time, and and that's all that matters. And that is going to be, I think, a, a confidence boost of sorts for the team. Now they they are going to have to follow it up. They, they can't are. simply. Roll in today and just assume now, now, now we're good. They're going to have to follow it up. But for today, let's all just enjoy what happened last night. I, I don't know. Yeah, you absolutely have to. I'm watching. I mean, it's on my, my Twitter feed, and it's just playing on a loop. The last strikeout from Suarez, they panned to Tatis and right, flips his hat around and gives the biggest, like, guttural, primal scream. He was so happy, and all the guys there waiting for him. He, it was such a team effort, though. I mean, it was such a team effort. You can't start off this show without lauding the at bat from Jacob oh. Cronenworth. Good Lord Almighty. Down eight nothing. How many pitches? Ten nine, nine. Nine pitch at bat, including a foul home run, and then a couple of fouled off pitches with two strikes yep. just to just to keep the at bat going. The kind of kind of at bat you see someone grinding like late in the season when they're trying to make the playoffs or in a playoff game. But down eight nothing. To see, you know, that kind of commitment to that at bat. And I get they're professionals. They should all be treating every at bat like that. But be it's honest, doesn't they, they, it doesn't happen. It didn't, in, even in this game, even in yesterday's game, they didn't treat every at bat like that. Not everybody on the team, certainly. Uh, and that's, I think, what really, really made me, I was very, very pissed and pissy and fussy uh, about halfway through that game. I What I saw from them, I said, you're giving up, dude. I'm watching you give up. Like that sucks. That started the seven run rally in the sixth. And then you had the just bizarre moment where the Padres then got aggressive. And that was the first of four straight pitches that were hits for so the Padres. Cool. Man well, I think they ruled Manny's an error, but he of scorched it. He scorched one, one in the right whole now. past Dansby Swanson. <laughs> I I would have given it a hit. And then um you had uh, Profar, who got moved up in the lineup, scorched one on the next pitch, and then Hassan Kim hit a triple into the gap on the next pitch, and li- literally it went from eight nothing, and you're feeling like this game is so over. I mean, why don't why don't you go to sleep? And then it was eight four with a runner at third base and nobody out, and you're thinking, okay, all of a sudden this absolutely is a game. Yeah, again. we cut it now. Yeah, I if I was a Cubs fan, all of a sudden I am very nervous at this point, and probably. And as you can tell, with good reason, it would they would have been nervous. Yeah, man, that was <laughs> that AB from Crony should should you should coaches should show their high school kids should show their little leaguers should show their I don't know if you have like an adult ball team that's maybe scuffling right now, you show them that's what you do you you fight and you fight and you fight and you fight and you don't give in and uh, it was just impressive and especially you know the score and all that but. You can't say enough good things about last night's game. It was so much fun to be a part of. I'm so glad I stayed up. Um, I I had considered, I had considered throwing in the towel for my mental health at at eight nothing. I just didn't like what I was seeing. Uh, you, you know what, man? Like, you can get down. You can get down. You can just get beat, and that happens. You get your ass kicked sometimes. It's like, all right, well, we got our ass kicked. But man, some of the stuff I saw early. It's tough, too. You Darvish comes out of the gate, and you're like, Woo, all right, he's got his good stuff tonight. Crisp as hell. <laughs> like, I'm super curious. crisp. They're- I'm curious. You just said uh, a lot of the stuff I saw early it Terrible. made you upset, made you angry, saw some of the texts. It wasn't yeah. great. Does the fact that they won completely erase all of that, or does that still linger at least? Is that still a, somewhat of a red flag? Maybe not a red flag, like an orange flag. Yeah, like, like a yellow warning hey, flag. That's still not okay. You still can't go down 8 nothing. Well, that, like, you, know, you can't go, pitch like that. You can't hit, do that. You can't have that approach. It's one thing. Or does it, it doesn't matter because now, they it, won. It's one thing for a, a veteran guy like you, Darvish, to – not be able to find his release point, be spiking balls, walking guys, giving up knocks. Got, yeah, got good hitters. They're big league hitters. They're going to get knocks. Fine. Like, 
What bothered me, I'll tell you, uh, it goes back to, I think, the fourth inning. It was Xander Bogarts, and he it was a 2-0 pitch, and I don't know if there were any outs. 2-0 pitch, and you're down at this point four zip. It was a 2-0 pitch, and it was a slider on the outside corner, and he just, <laughs> just wet news. Look at uh, Matt Carpenter. Just wet newspaper, to ground, lazy ground ball, that he's out. My blood pressure went through the roof. My ears started to burn. And I'm like, bro, in what plan, on what planet is that an okay 2-0 hack? 2-0 hack is time to rip, time to find a gap. I got to get on bait. And it was, and I, at that point, I go, oh, you guys are just done. You're ready to go home. You're ready to, to, to take it to the, to the house. And that's the one that I was, inf- I was infuriated by that at bat. I really was. That does not make it okay. Did he come through later? Yes, he came through later. Was I surprised that he came through later? Yes, the way he's been swinging the bat right now. He totally redeemed himself for that horrible, horrible give up of an A-B. You, Darvish, I don't know what the hell happened from the first to the second. I did feel like, and I do feel like with you, Ben, and, and ask uh, answer me this. Does he sometimes just lose the plot because he tries to do too many things i'm like throw you just throw your fast like throw your fastball establish your fastball he's spinning it this way everything's hanging like it was it was a bad bad out it was such a weird outing for you darvish because he he retired the side in the first on i think nine pitches eight or nine pitches got two quick outs in the second and you're going he is on cruise yeah, control and then the two out nightmares and man. then uh he gave up the two out double and then I think it was the next batter where he went to a full count and he threw a pitch that dot lit up the zone right at the yep. knees and he didn't, didn't get, the, get call. the call. <laughs> and then he got a well, release point got away and he nicked a guy and all of a sudden now the bases are loaded and he goes full on Ian Happ who's been red hot to start the season and he, he spun one he got to throw a strike there he spun one up now it's two nothing and then Bellinger makes it four nothing it just got away really. Really so quickly fast, there, man. and uh, to me, it's you almost kind of throw that out the window just a little bit. Uh, then he came back and threw a, a good third inning, but at that point, his pitch count was so high, Mike Schilt decided, let's not tax any more of you Darvish's innings. Let's go to yeah. go to Avila, and then Avila gives up four, and you're going okay. The game the game's over. <laughs> you do have to credit Pedro Avila though for if he doesn't pitch the next two innings, the fifth and the sixth, and keep it at eight, which seems weird, like. But what, what he, is he that struck a, out the side in yeah. the six? Like but the, the 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 actual value right there is keeping it dude. at eight for two innings after you just gave up four and you couldn't seemingly throw a strike. They, they don't win the game unless he does that. Yep. If he lets it get any further away, they don't win that game. And you never know where that value comes in, and that's why that's why you know coaches will always say, "Hey, doesn't matter what the score is, you battle every at bat, whether you're a pitcher or a hitter." You never know when things are going to change and go a different direction, and and they did for the Padres last night. Yeah, they really did. It was so cool to see. Um, it, it, a total, total team effort. It really was. Um, you know, I, again, I know Manny's still searching right now. He's still searching. That that that's unquestioned. Like he is absolutely fighting it. There's something missing in, in his swing. In his first AB. He had a chance to do some major, major damage. What's the pitcher's name? Assad. Javier Assad. I mean, this dude is literally hangs like a like a two one splitter slider something, and it was up in the zone. And I went, "Oh, you're dead!" And man, he swung right through it. And I went, "Ooh, all right, he's he's not seeing it. There's something something amiss." Uh, with Manny, he just missed a fastball later in the game uh, with a runner on. So. Maybe he's coming around. He did smoke that ball, like you said, under Dans- Danby- Dansby Swanson's glove. Um, maybe he's coming around a little bit, but it's weird to have a, a score nine unanswered runs and, and him not do anything, really. He did, like you said, he did get on. They did call it an error. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the other guys, bro, Jackson Merrill's A.B.'s late, spectacular. Eggy Rosario working a walk, which was huge. <laughs> like, it was, it was pretty awesome. All right, I know that um... – that many of you threw in the towel last night. Yeah. At eight nothing. Including someone in this room. It was not me. We'll get to that uh, coming up. What am I in trouble? No, you're not in trouble. I already get, I, so I've already relax, issued forgiveness relax. to everybody. It's, all, it's okay. But I am it's okay. I am curious to hear the stories out there. Yeah, I am too. Of not necessarily close, not man. necessarily why you threw in the towel. Everyone understands why you threw in the towel. <laughs> I want to know how you found out 
that they won. Did someone send you a text? Did it happen this morning when you woke up and turned on Ben and Woods and heard Woods screaming for some reason? I'm going, that out, what's man. going on? Did you wake up in the middle of the night and look at your phone? How did you find out that the game went a different way than you expected it to? We get to that. Uh, it should be a good show this morning. Jesse Agler will join us at 835, but we're just talking Padres. Can't wait for his calls on the wrap-up here at 635. We're already into it. There's no foreplay. There's no setting the menu. We're already eating this morning with Ben and Woods. Let's check traffic with Kelly on 97.3 The Fan. We'll be right back.
I was about to get on the night train last night, man. I was just, I was this close to just going into the kitchen and pouring. And it wasn't going to be night train. We can do a little bit better than that. But I was about to go in the kitchen and pour myself a nice, tall makers and water. And just go, what are we doing here, these guys, man? It was unbelievable. An unbelievable night at, at Petco Park. Oh, happy birthday, Petco Park, by the way. It's one way to uh, ring in your birthday with a uh, phenomenal, phenomenal come-from-behind victory. I was uh, So it was 8 uh, nothing, and then the Padres score their seven in a row. And I didn't get a text from either one of you. So I, I just texted to the thread. And I go, couldn't move. Ch- checking to see if either of you are awake because it's 8-7 now. And I didn't get a response for a few minutes. And then I wrote, yup. Yup, I got from Woods. <laughs> I couldn't but, move. I was I was frozen solid. But when I got nothing from Polly after you know ten fifteen minutes, I realized oh you know he's he's in bed. And he Polly gets sack, up Jack. very early, probably made the responsible, smart decision to go to bed, turn it in, and be ready to go for our show in the morning. I have a bedtime, and when you're down eight nothing, I don't I really don't care what happens after that. You have cut <laughs> into my bedtime. You're not going to affect my mood. You're not going to affect my beauty sleep. You're, you're not, not going to get affect, me. Uh, I'm going to be well rested for work in the morning. <laughs> yep. Like, I mean, if they're up eight nothing, I would have gone to sleep as well. Yeah, I, like, I almost tweeted last night when it was eight nothing. I don't know what this is in me that needs to continue to watch this. <laughs> and it's you know, well, you covered the team fine. I could easily, if they lost eight nothing or twelve nothing, I could have easily come in and say I watched till it was eight nothing and I went to bed and I would not have felt guilty about it at all, <laughs> uh, because you know you do got to be sharp, you got to be awake. And bro, when they started coming back, and I almost thought to myself, this is worse, this is worse, because now I got to come in tomorrow and Ben's gonna be like, yeah, did you see the fight though? We did lose, <laughs> we lost nine to three, but we did fight, see, and, and I, was, that's, I couldn't. And that's deal what with I was it. talking about in our last segment. I'm like, you, yes. They showed fight. They came back. They scored nine unanswered. They also gave up eight unanswered. Like, that's part of the story yes, as well. No doubt. But for me, dude, like, yeah, I watched, uh, I was watching more of the basketball game because it was four nothing real fast in that game. Very, it was like, very fast. All right. Second half's about to start. So I flipped over to the basketball, watched until that one became a laugher. And then it was eight nothing. I said, no, nah, I'm going to bed. I think my buddy was at the game. He texted me, I think, after Crony's home run, 8-2. to two. I'm like, fantastic. Yeah, I'm, great. Had already rolled over, plugged in the phone, was going to sleep. I think my wife was still awake and like woke me up when I was half asleep. She goes, it's 8-7, to seven, but I don't even remember yeah. that. So when did you find out that they won? Not until the morning? The morning. Yeah, Not until you got up in the morning? 3.40 a.m.? <laughs> was, it, was it the text? What was the first indication? Uh, So... You don't know anything about the focus modes on your iPhones, I'm sure. I've never heard of it. <laughs> I have set up my focus <laughs> so that I am on do not disturb until my alarm goes off. And then all of my notifications kind of populate all at once. So I was kind of going through this, the push notifications. And I think it was an ESPN or MLB app or whatever. It just said Padres win 9-8. to uh, Watch Fernando Tatis Jr. go ahead home run. I was like, oh, sweet. Good. I mean, it's so it's cool. definitely better than the alternative of waking up and yeah, that one really got out of hand after I went to sleep. Yeah. So again, I've uh, I have issued not that I have the authority to do so, but full forgiveness yeah, for pardon. anyone who you got a pardon. turned it off, left who, the game, who tweeted something mean, who streamed out of Petco Park in the fifth <laughs> inning yesterday. Oh, I had a couple friends do yeah. that. Oh, I saw a lot oh, of those stories. If it was if I was there last night, uh, four was going to be that when it was four nothing. That was it. I was out. I'm going home, and I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and rot because we got a show to do. I'm going home. Second inning. Four, yeah. Yeah. four nothing in the second. You're like, all right, well. All right, Bo, you ready? <laughs> That's it. All right, yes, we yes, we can go to Gallagher Square. Yes, we'll find the brick. Yes, you can play on the playground. But then we're getting the hell out of here. And that's exactly what I would have done. I don't blame anybody. I left the friggin' playoff game that we came back and won. So I'm not going to bust anybody's chops about anything ever. You do what you got to do for your mentals. That's And I was... I was a fingernail width away from just going, you know what? F this. Yeah, I'm so glad I didn't. I, got, I loved watching that so much. So I, much. I got a very sympathetic text from my mom at 8 nothing. Sweet angel. Because she knows it's uh, going to be a tough show when you have to talk about a game like that. And I go, yeah, we'll, we'll get through it. Not my favorite kind of show when the Padres get routed, <laughs> of course. But we'll, we'll make it through to the next day. And then about 30 minutes after the game, I saw she calling. 
And she had just found out because they stopped watching too. They did. They didn't know until after the game. Someone texted her and come back and go. She goes, come back. And she said, I looked on my phone and screamed and dad, well, they won. They won. <laughs> we got the so, uh, annual happened. text from my buddy Dan Brozo last night. How dare you get me into this effing sport? Uh, 8.03 p.m., I believe. 8.03 p.m. How dare you get me into this effing sport? I, 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 he, I guess he blames me for getting him into to Padres baseball. And then uh, a couple hours later, of course, I get the, how dare you take so long to get me into this effing sport? It was such a, it was such a uh, roller coaster last night for this team. It was awesome. It was so awesome. All right, we're going to come back, and we will hear the highlights. Yeah, finally. I need them all, man. I want to hear the Cubs, what they sounded like. I want to hear all of it. Let's see, what Korea, do we have? What they, they sounded like. The home run. Toddy's home run. We have, of course, Jesse Agler. Yep. We have Don Orsillo. Yep. yep. We have John Boog Shambi. Oh. Mm-hmm. And we have the Korean call. Ah. The, uh, just behind the scenes, we actually had reached out to Boog to come on today. He may he's, still come on. Tomorrow. He may still come on today or tomorrow. He's, he texted me over on Sunday and was he's willing to come on. He just he's not going to want to come on after that I, one. Well, I wouldn't either. He might. I, I mean, but I wouldn't. Knowing you know us, that mean this wouldn't be a fun day to come on and when we answer, talk we just cubs. go ha 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 <laughs> 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 nanny nanny boo boo. <laughs> Boog is a pro, and he, he's the best. He may actually still come on. So we'll, <laughs> we know we'll have Jesse Agler at eight thirty-five, but we'll hear his calls and more, and your calls as well. If you want to share your story, did you stick around? Did you leave early? What was your story? Eight three three two eight eight zero ninety seven three. All when we come back on San Diego's number one sports station, ninety seven three. The fam.
As I said yesterday on the show, I thought last night's game was going to be an important one to set the tone for an important week early in the season for the Padres. If you'll remember, Padres went into last night's game two games under 500 at 5 and 7, have three against the Cubs, who just took two or three from the Dodgers and are playing really well. And you could see why early in the game. They put together good at bats, they do not swing at bad pitches very often. They were putting balls in play. They were working you Darvish hard. And the Cubs were playing well. And then you got to go to L.A. for three against the Dodgers. It just felt like, and still does, like a dangerous week early in the season. You don't want to dig yourself an early hole. So when you've got your ace against Javier Assad, a good, good young pitcher from Tijuana. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> how? How how does he? How was he getting out last night? I, I watched his stuff. It did not. Look, it does not look spectacular. And I, they're showing his numbers, and they're talking about, you know, they're talking about how he pitches. And I'm watching it, going, I don't get it. I've seen guys with much better stuff and better location, you know, struggle. Maybe it was the Padres. The Padres bats early. I don't know, but maybe. It, but this the, has happened. The Cronenworth home run in the sixth was the first run he had given up all season. The first two runs he had given up all, all season, season in his two starts, and he had a three ERA. I know. In yes, last year, that's so what, that's what I'm saying. Solid. It's like he's it, it, crafty. Must be very very crafty. Uh, tough to pick up or something because the stuff certainly doesn't overpower you, and he looked fantastic. What a, I mean for him. You, you, that's a guaranteed dub, dude. You feel like you walked off. He absolutely did his job last night, and you feel like you got that one in the in the bank. No, bullpen imploded. You know the bummer for me, Benny. Early in the game is when you heard about and remembered. Cubs had a getaway day. Sat through a three hour rain delay. Got in at three o'clock in the morning. You're like, oh, these guys are going to be gassed. No, I mean they came out firing. And did that catch up to them later in the night? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, or did their bullpen just? beyond implode um maybe that that was the case maybe a confluence of all those things but that was one if you're the Padres and as a Padres fan you're watching going you can't look these guys just got here three o'clock in the morning they got to be gassed but the you know the vibes of a win like that are, are certainly something good and, and hopefully they'll carry over for the Padres but the actual win I thought was important coming for, coming from behind and actually winning that game to start this week and having now two chances to win the series against the Cubs before you go to LA, you know, try to try to have a winning week or at least a three and three week. You know, you take you take that, I said yesterday, and I think yeah. the Padres still would, but you get that first one, you feel better about the rest of this week. Well, you get that first one in that man you know, in that manner, and that just you you're right. You said it earlier. There was a there was a bit of a cloud hanging over it. And we said it yesterday. We pounded it that they didn't have any clutch in them. It just feels like they're allergic to success sometimes. Um, they don't fight. They they put together bad abs. They did all of those things for half of the game. I mean, they couldn't. You could not have seen a worse six innings from from your baseball club. And then for whatever reason, you know, for whatever reason, I, I again turn to Jake Cronenworth and his at bat, bro. If you're watching that and you're on the bench, you're on deck, you're in the hole, you go, oh, so he's working. I got to work, right? I got to I got to grind. Uh, because Jakey's up there, he's not giving up down eight nothing. I, I, I can't say enough good things about that AB. That was that was textbook. Well, you're going to hear it uh, as part of our Padres wrap up. We will get right to it, and all the calls from last night's come from behind win after this check of traffic on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Davick. Couple problems here, guys. A hit and run crash on the Sixth Avenue off ramp northbound at five. Also, possible encampment fire westbound eight before Mission Gorge. Some smoke visible from the brush over to the right shoulder. The Cordell and Cordell traffic cam shows that big rig fire has cleared on the coastline northbound five before Palomar Airport Road. And Kelly Danick with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. I love winning, man. I love winning. You hear what I'm saying? It's like better than losing. Oh my God, I'm so stiff. <laughs> <laughs> Miss any of the Padres win yesterday? Ben and Woods didn't. What up, crew? We've got you covered with all of the highlights. I like it when the Padres win. Yeah! 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 It's the Padres wrap up presented by Hamul Casino. With thrilling slots and tables and all the best rewards, Hamul Casino has all the fun you're looking for. Hamul Casino, fun above all else. Yeah! Give me a do damage. Do damage. 
Three and two again. Darvish delivers, yeah. half swings, lines it into right field, and a base hit. Horner has scored. Talkman is on his way. He will score. Amaya held at third. A two-run single for Ian Happ, and the Cubs lead it two to nothing. Everybody ready? Runners lead at all three stations. 0-2 to Bellinger. Darvish delivers, and a line drive past Cronenworth into right field base hit. Amaya has scored. Happ is on his way. The throw and the tag, not in time. Bellinger ends up at second on the throw. Two more runs, and the Cubs lead it 4-0 against a tiring U Darvish here in the second. Runners lead it first and second. Pitch to Morrell, hit on the ground sharply. Fair at third, off the glove of Wade, who dove after it. It ends up down the line in foul territory. Happ has scored. Suzuki stops at third, and Morrell ends up at second with the Cubs now in front, 6 to nothing. First pitch to the right-hand hitter, hit in the air to deep right field. Tatis back towards the porch, leaps up, can't make the catch, it's off the top of the wall, rolls all the way out to right center. Both runs score easily, Swanson just jogging into third with a triple. Cubs lead it eight to nothing, and now the question becomes, how is Fernando? He hit the wall really, really hard out in right field. Not running, and Ooh, he's fine, in the air to deep right field, and no doubter for Jake, second deck, no, but a long home run. A two-run shot, and the Padres are on the board here in the sixth. Jake's first of the year, and what an at-bat against Asad. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Runnerworth at the two-run homer to end Asad's night. Now Quas has two guys on as Kim swings at the first pitch, lines it into right in a base hit. Manny comes in to score. It's misplayed by Talkman in right. That's going to allow Profar to come in and score. Kim is on his way to third. The throw, not in time. Hello, eight to four. Kim at third, nobody out. Here's the 2-1. Cambusano, little looper over the mound. Fielded by Horner. Only plays to first in time. Kim comes in to score, and it's eight to five. Here's the pitch. Bogart sits it in the air to deep left. Hap goes back. He's going to look. It's going to go. Two run, home run, Xander Bogarts. His first of the year, and it's a one-run game in the sixth. Here's the 1-0. and oh. Fernando hits it in the air to deep left. Hap is back at the wall. Going to go! Two-run homer, and the Padres lead it. Nine to eight. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Swing and a miss. Another fastball as Suarez closes it out, one, two, three, and the Padres complete a historic comeback, 9-8 over the Cubs. Not one guy, when that score was 8 nothing, was, they actually came together more, started talking more, and started to say, okay, how are we gonna figure this out? And, um, man, really impressive and proud of the club. Mike Schilt, very uh, you pleased you guys with his buy, fight. You buy that? That the team actually came together more. I no. believe that he believes that. <laughs> <laughs> Did they say? Do you believe that? Toddy was like, "No, no, we're gonna, we're really, we're gonna keep fighting." They never, they never doubted. They had faith for the faithful. <sighs> How? <laughs> Sometimes you just pretend. You fake it. You so just you fake, fake it. it. No, no, and, we'll be all right. Sometimes we have those shows I where think, I'm like, "We're gonna be fine," and then inside, I'm screaming internally. <laughs> I don't know. These guys are obviously built different than any of us. Yeah. Anybody listening? But for me, I'm thinking probably eight four is when I'm like, oh, we got ourselves a ball game, bro. The four hits on four consecutive pitches. Ben had a great tweet. This game just became a game in a matter of seconds. Yeah, it went from I not mean, a game to a game in lightning speed. I think it, you're full of crap if you're like, oh no, eight nothing. Eight I nothing. Was, I was I been locked in. I, was I, was, I couldn't. No. And, and what I was seeing is what was leading me to that point of no return of not believing and losing my faith because again just not competitive they just didn't look competitive at all and when jake went up and competed when he went up and competed his ass off that's when i said and hey, listen it's only eight two at that point you still got to overcome six runs and they got good arms down in the the cubs bullpen and i thought oh, man, that's cool i had seen a stat uh, like an expected stat. No one has caught more barrels lately than Jake Cronorth. He was like the next pick to hit a home run because his swings have been so good. He's been catching so many barrels and been hitting it, hitting it so hard. The law of averages says you're going to get one at some point. And sure enough, he did. 
And he's worked his tail off, man. I'm very, very happy for him and want to see him continue to have this kind of season because um, we, we need it from him. But the Xander home run is what got me. When Xander hit that bomb, I said, we can win this game. What I didn't want to happen and what I really feared was going to happen was to get oh so close and even, Ben, to take the lead and Suarez come out and try to nibble and hit a guy and then the thing just spirals. <laughs> but when he came out, like I said, unzipped it and said, Here four, here's 14 heaters. Do your worst. Was so impressive, so impressive and dominant from him last night. Loved hearing uh, Jesse and Tony call the comeback, but – it, to be fair, because I, I've given Jesse a lot of praise yesterday, Don's call of Fernando's home run on TV I thought was one of his oh yeah his real greats. Paulie, do we have a little Don or Silo Padres dot TV? Sure do of the uh, of the Fernando Tatis Jr. home run in the eighth. High drive, deep left field, at the wall, gone. Padres trailed eight to nothing. Fernando makes it 9-8. Unbelievable. I loved it, man. So good. It's, That's it's, so, I channel, so Don, so good. I channel so much Don when I'm on the mic doing PA. It's really like, it's who I channel the most is <laughs> and, Don Orsillo. And how about uh, the discipline of mud to not say anything not say a at word. all? I will say this, too. I, um, when they got down 8 nothing, I started listening to, to Mud and Don. They were dying. I mean, they were struggling. At that point, you know, it was pretty early. And you know they're looking at each other going, we got to fill. We got to. This is, this is a nightmare, right? <laughs> and I thought they did such a good job. And I even thought I even thought when Crony hit the homer, Don probably gave it a little too much, right? Like that, down 8-2, he still was like super. He gave it a lot. He gave, yeah, it, he a gave lot. it a lot. It was a great at-bat. It was a great at-bat. No question about it. Um, and I just, I was like, all right, settle down. Don. This is eight two. I mean, that guy knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. It was, it was very, very special. Can't wait to talk to Jesse to, to oh, later on today. Find out how it was. So, uh, Tim in the chat says, uh, listen to the Cubs TV this morning. They were very sad. Kept doing the percent to win thing. What and, was it? By well, the way? it was uh, from what I saw and Sarah Langs did her. Wee. Yeah. On the uh, on the the chances to win graph, I saw ninety nine point two percent after the fifth inning when it was eight nothing. Cubs had a ninety nine point two percent chance of winning that game. Padres were at zero point eight percent, and they came back to win. So as you can imagine, point eight percent. I doubt ninety nine point two is the. F- Highest it got, I think. I doubt that. Uh, I doubt that the Cubs broadcasters were quite as enthusiastic. But let's uh, let's hear. Do we have Boog? Boog's sure. actual call here. Ooh. Left field, half going back near the wall, and it's gone. And Tatis has given the Padres the lead. It's nine eight. Mm. You got all the facts in. <laughs> yeah. He covered the facts yeah. and the facts only, man. He ma'am. did not lie. Just, Just the, the facts, facts ma'am. Yeah. Tatis is 0.8%. 0.8%. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. That's fantastic. You we, need, we I needed that. This, we got to play the last one. Right? I needed that. Yeah, needed let's, um, oh. so let's, let's hear how it sounded for the people who were listening overseas in I mean, Korea. Come on. <laughs> Superstar, <laughs> 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 The, oh, hey. wow. the color commentator like almost sounds like he's having a religious <laughs> experience. I don't, I don't know Korean. I want to know what "shuposta" "shuposta" means when he's going like. I love it, that. It's almost as though he's having like an out of body experience. Oh. <laughs> Say, there's 15 in there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 But if you really like, <laughs> bro, who's a bigger Padres fan than those guys? Like, <laughs> no, no, you, 
You can None. Have, I used to go to see games at Lane Field. Yeah, have you heard the <laughs> Korean guys call the game? Listen, you got nothing on you. From the beginning again, yeah. you hear the bat crack and they just the, lose ah! it. Like, nobody in this room even had that no. kind of reaction. Eagle ah! Tech! I please let me, please set up a feed so that I can go do games like I would do that. Studio! Like the alternate feed, the alt feed of me, and they're just I want screaming. A, I, want a web, I want a webcam oh. on oh. those guys constantly now. Yeah. I don't know where they are. Constantly. Are they in Korea and watching it on a monitor? I have no idea. They love yeah. Baseball Nick just said in the chat they love their jobs. I got dude. Yes, <laughs> that is, you cannot fake that enthusiasm. You just can't fake. Oh. It. <laughs> Fantastic, man. But oh my God. <laughs> perhaps the most memorable soundbite from the entire night is not any of the calls, not Jesse, Don, Boog, or the Korean guys, but it comes from Sam Levitt's post game interview this, wow, man. on 97 3 The Fan with Fernando Tatis Jr. Now, usually they get him on TV, but instead it was during the radio interview with Sammy. That uh, who was it in the background there? It's Manny and is that Sugar? It might be that uh, have the Gatorade bucket, ice cold water, I believe, and they go after and they get both Tatis and Sammy gets a pretty pretty good uh, do dousing of water as well. Here's what it sounded like last night here on 97.3 The Fan. <laughs> Who's the life pitch? The water cooler just dumped yeah, over both of us. That's got to feel pretty good. Oh, it feels amazing. Oh, my God. Oh, it's incredible. I need more of this. Do it again tonight, and you'll get another one. I promise you. The um, the sound that Fernando makes, though, is... <laughs> <laughs> it's cold. I don't. I wouldn't like that very I mean, much. They, he did not dodge it at all. He didn't, he didn't see it coming, either. You know how sometimes they kind of sense yeah, it, yeah. and they start... Running away, he he got caught off guard. I don't know why he should have been expecting that one, but Sammy kind of saw it coming because he was facing the other direction. But he didn't even be able to clear out completely, and uh, that was a great moment. Yeah, it was amazing man. Uh, Kez says Tetsuki yells like he's getting stabbed. Yeah, That's yeah, what he did. Probably feels like um, so. That was awesome. That was a great night last night. Great I mean, night last night for Sammy too. That moment, like, yeah, getting to be down there. You got to so have. Cool. Like you're getting that, you got to take a screenshot of like as the water's coming out of the bucket. Fernando and you are both there. Oh. You got to get that framed. Oh, it's Sammy. It's it's going to be going viral on TikTok. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> he'll he'll turn it into some sort of moment that reaches 87 million people worldwide <laughs> right. Right. by the end of the day today. That's it's Sammy. We know that it will be uh, it will be handled properly by Sam Levitt going forward. God, it was so fun. So much fun. Let's do it again tonight. How about that? That would be good. That'd be well, phenomenal. you know, and tonight, uh, so I I, lo I like that Joe Musgrove's on the mound tonight. I'd say that. Yeah. Thank you. Feels like the right guy to, to come back after a game like that, the way he, you know, prepares and his intensity. Because there, can be there can be a letdown after a, a good sure. win like that as well. It's not always, oh, well, now we're rolling. It can be. That was very emotional, and we're spent. And do we have anything left? And I trust that Joe Musgrove... You know, he, he doesn't always throw a perfect game, but he's going to go out and he'll be prepared. He'll be intense. He'll be ready to go. The right emotional leader for tonight's game. Anniversary of his no-hitter, by the way. And today. the anniversary of Joe's no-no. Yes. April 9th, 2021. Three years ago today. I love it. All right. We'll come back. Uh, hour number two of Men and Woods. I want to get to some of your phone calls. I uh, do want to talk briefly about the national championship game last night as well. Take on Woods is ahead. Don't go away. San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3. The fan.
No balls in one strike. The big right-hander ready and delivers. Swing and a ground ball to shortstop. Kim has it. Friendly hop. Throw to first. That is a no-hitter, and that is history. Joe Musgrove with the first no-hitter in Padre history. April 9th, 2021 at Globe Life Field in Arlington, Texas. The kid comes home, and he gets it done. You know, Padres still don't don't have a no-hitter in the first 20 years at Petco Park. That would be nice to get that done tonight. Check off that box, Joe, on the anniversary of your no-hitter no three years ago. Get away. You can't, I can't ask no, for a no-hitter, too. No, just get a win, for the love of God. After a, a, a 0.8% chance comeback the night before, just follow that up with a no-no. You greedy ass. I, I know. He's that guy. I am that guy. I would have liked to see the Padres win the World Series so, in four. But... Uh, I've seen a ton of people. <laughs> on... I just wish they weren't wearing those uniforms. I wish they were wearing the, these uniforms. <laughs> I mean, that moment of them cool. dogpiling on the mound after their first World Series, it's going to live forever. It's good. They're in the I sand. just don't like those uniforms. <laughs> That's bad. I see, That's um, I see a ton of people on our, our YouTube chat on Twitter after we played all the great calls going, what about the Spanish call? What about it? We can't find we it. Can someone send it. it to us, Eduardo's call? Of that I would love to hear it. So there was a, 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 a Twitter account that would always send them out, and we can't find them anywhere. Well, it was the official Padre Spanish yeah. language account. It was Los wasn't Padres. it? Los, Los Padres. Padres. Isn't that official? Yeah. But I, we, we didn't see it last yeah, night. Yeah, Adam so running the, the if, uh, admin if, over if there. If what anyone are we doing? has <laughs> it, just uh, tag us on social media so we can find it. We'd love to play the Spanish call. We, we just could not find it last night. We don't have... We don't have the access I mean, to the archives on that one. We've talked about it now a couple times already this week. We want to play the Korean calls for every big moment this season. Literally, I want to play uh, Eddie's as well. Paulie. Edward Ortega is one of the greatest play-by-play men Ever. out there. And we are lucky enough to have him along with everybody else on the broadcast team. I, would, I want to play those. I played the Korean calls of just double plays. Like, <laughs> I'm just... I'm just do the whole bro- I want to find out where I can watch the Korean broadcast in its entirety. I don't speak Korean, not a lick. But it was it was great. Yeah. So if anybody oh! has <laughs> if, anybody, if anybody has any insight where we can find oh, wow. Eddie Ortega's call, please send him our way. Happy to happy to play. Oh, God. As you know my opinion that uh, Eddie He's the goat, should man. be going into the uh, broadcasters wing of the Hall of Fame. No that should that should question. be happening sooner rather than later but uh, hopefully before the end of the show we'll find that and play that version as well i i did want to quickly because you mentioned robert suarez and just the 14 pitches of gas in the eighth inning and i mentioned pedro avila after giving up four runs coming back and throwing two more innings give uh Eniel de los santos and wandy peralta some of the credit for the win as well when you score seven runs the last thing that you really can afford in a comeback is then to give up runs right after that. And uh, Eniel, re- really quick inning, 10-pitch inning, Wandy, 8-pitch inning. The Cubs never they, they never got off the mat. Once the Padres kind of started their comeback, the Cubs could do nothing to stop it and give credit to the Padres' bullpen for making it that way and getting the job done in a situation where the game was very much still in doubt and that comeback was not assured. And everyone had to play their part, and I wanted to give those guys some credit as well. No question. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, no question. The The shutdown inning after <sighs> it was Eniel De Los Santos, the shutdown inning that he had, I went, all right, let's go. Yeah. Now, that's exactly what you needed. There was no messing around from the back end of the bullpen yesterday whatsoever. Um, you Darvish is going to figure it out. You Darvish lost the – the plot with his release point. Ball looks like it was slipping out of his hands. I, I'm not worried about him figuring out what exactly went, went wrong. And again, I know Avila, you know, gave up four runs, but his fifth and sixth, I believe, uh, K, you know, K the side, he was fantastic. I mean, yeah, man, you're a mop up guy. You're going in there to just get outs, and and he got some really big ones when we needed it the most. And you can't say enough about the job Schilt did managing once they got in in range, Ben. The guys went out and executed too. It was it was beautiful. Still, it really was. still a small sample size, but De Los Santos now one point eight zero ERA. Yep. Uh, Peralta one point five nine. Suarez one point five zero. That that's, that's starting to round into. All right, form. that's that's a seventh, eighth, ninth combination that you can feel pretty good about for a bullpen that's been shaky in some of the other options. Those guys are starting to emerge a little bit as. As reliable options for Mike Schilt. Now, so what do you do if you're Mike Schilt today? Because we spent a lot of time yesterday talking about rejiggering the lineup. 
<laughs> and when the lineup came out, I went, <laughs> so I'm like, he's like, hey, y'all want to change? You got it. And he moved Merrill up a spot. He split. He flipped Profar, Profar and Kim. And Kim which, five, six. Yeah, that worked pretty well. Um, now do you, you ride with this. Now do you just keep rolling with that? I think um, against righties and the way Profar has been hitting, that makes sense. Who's, I think who's throwing today for I them? I think against a lefty, they're going with a bullpen kind of game. Okay. I think it's uh, yeah. Brown. Uh, some he hasn't done well out of their bullpen, but it's like a spot emergency start. It was a TBD until yesterday. So yeah, he's someone you want to uh, kind of go after early, but you don't necessarily craft an entire lineup from a guy who might only be in for two or three innings. So we'll see. I, I'd say why not same lineup after. Yeah. What happened last night? I, I mean, Jackson Merrill, I'll, I'll continue with my argument from yesterday. He moved up one spot. So he was like the eight hole. He was, I, I think. The two hole. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> oh, because I thought yesterday you said the nine hole was like the one. It is. So the eight would then be. No, because the, the, the lineup is a circle, and that is not how it works. Moron. Skip, where am I hitting? Two. Oh, wow. Crazy. Eight. Actually, but it's like if you start at eight, that would make Tyler Wade your two hitter, <laughs> which doesn't make a lot of sense at all in my lineup construction. But uh, we'll see if they they change the lineup or keep the lineup. Hi, the this same. is Jackson. Hi, Jackson. Hi, Jackson. I, he was on base for both of the home runs, yep. by the way, Xander's and Tatis's one and, for three with a walk His batting three twenty four. His OPS is eight sixty four. Benjamin kid looks pretty unfazed. Uh, yeah, being on base for the two bombs yeah. is pretty clutch that late in the game. So, yeah, he's he's fairly unflappable right now. Just want to, uh, if you want to get online for Take on Woods here in a couple of minutes, 833-288-0973. Call in now. Play our game. Chance to qualify for the trip to Las Vegas in just a moment. Did also have the NCAA championship game. There's, there's not a ton to say. UConn was the best team last year. Won every game in March Madness by at least 13 points. UConn was the best team again this year and won every game in March Madness by at least 13 points. Had the 15-point win yesterday against Purdue. And give credit, the Boilermakers played their butts off in the first half. Zach Eady yeah, was terrific. Was it was it tied at halftime? No, it was no. a six-point game, but it was I tied it late in the first I half. I checked it at one some point. time and was like, all right. The, UConn's strategy, though, was basically mostly single coverage on Edie. Occasionally they went to the double team, but mm -hmm. they knew he'd get his points, and they just made sure that no one else could hurt hurt them. And Edie got 37, but they, no one else really did anything, and it was more than a, a good enough strategy to you win that game. had a guy, Donovan Klingon? Klingon, yeah. He's seven foot two. He looked like a child. Couldn't stop. Up against Edie. I thought, I thought seven, he'd do four, a, 300 pounds. I thought Klingon would do a better job stopping Edie. Edie was so good last night. No, I but mean, I, I loved UConn's strategy. They just said, look, Edie's going to score. He's going to do his thing. Nobody else is going to beat us, though. And, I mean, he had over, Edie had over half their points. Like, they really shut everyone else down. It's a good strategy. But, Dan Hurley's an amazing coach. But uh, UConn did a good job when they did miss of, of getting enough rebounds. And they're just such a balanced team. Uh, you know, they have no real star stars. They're just all good players. The offense is so effective. They run it so well. And uh, they're already co-favorites next year with Duke, uh, you know, with a chance to win three Oof. titles in a row. Sixth overall title. And I thought it was ironic, you know, Purdue, really good team. Considered number one, number two, pretty much all season long. And their score, the final score yesterday was 75-60. The final score last year, UConn SDSU, 76-59. It was Jeez, it was man. one point off on each score. It was essentially UConn did the exact same thing this year they did last year. Just ran right through everybody in the tournament, including the championship yeah. game. That is so Impressive, unbelievable. Man. Even some of the great teams in basketball history had to survive a a buzzer beater, you know, well, early in the tournament. And what they lose? How many guys did they lose? They lost a lot. Yeah, a lot of guys. Guys. It's a completely different team, and <laughs> yeah. they were talking about that on the broadcast. Come and that's, on, man. that's what stood out the most to me. Like they showed how dominant last year's team was. Yeah. And they go, "This is a new team, and they're better." <laughs> like God. Dang. Well, it's so nice to have a baseball team like that, right? <laughs> just, you roll through everybody in the playoffs, then you come in, you're like, these guys are actually better. They win another one. There's Man. talk that Kentucky may come try to poach Danny Hurley, and UConn's already pushing back. Like, we will do everything in our power to keep him. Blank check. From, yeah, so yeah. Danny Buying Hurley's him. in a very good spot right now. You can get him that portable washing machine so that his wife no longer has to wash his, exactly. his man panties when they're on the road. It's unbelievable. <laughs> 
I got a game. Get my ass together, please. She's back there. <laughs> He's a lunatic. Though. He's they, a lunatic. They were up, what, 17 late in the game. He actually ran on the court and shoved yes. one of his players was during the game. Like, move. <laughs> they start going to the offense like it was a practice it or was something. Like it was, he, thought he, he thought they were in practice yeah. or something. The guy was just dribbling <laughs> right in front of his own bench. Like, go, go. And he and ran on the court and pushed him in the butt. Shoves him. The ref goes, <laughs> You can't do that. That's a turnover or something. I think he like invented the call. Like, what do you call when the coach just runs like, up and shoves one of his players? It wasn't a technical. We're just going to turn over to the other team. I have you no idea him what and, that uh, is. They called a timeout, and Zach Eady walked past him. He, had to, he was on the opposite side of the court from their bench. Zach Eady, all seven four, three hundred pounds of him, walks by little Dan Hurley, and they exchange words. They started talking to S. I'm yeah. like, what are you doing? It was awesome. He's a loon. <laughs> He's, He's crazy. A loon. Man, God, he's a good coach. That's very impressive. Very impressive. So congrats to the UConn Huskies well, started, on a second straight title. I started riding them. After they were a good bet they all the way really through. really nice bet. Covered every game, every, right? Oh. Won and covered and, every single game. And then some. I mean, just incredible. Great, uh, Good teams win championships. Great teams cover and, and win, win championships. championships. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, no buzzer beaters. No, nothing really ever in doubt. So it's a, as, a, as a better, you're like, this is... Game's too easy. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. All right, I uh, see we got some callers on the line. Let's get to it. It is time to play Take on Woods. All right, let's see. Uh, Billy, are you there, there? Yeah, I'm here. Billy, are you here to play Take on Woods? I am. All right. You are a contestant yeah, today. Take on Woods is brought to you by Valvoline Instant Oil Change. It only takes 15 minutes. You don't have to get out of your car for directions and discounts. Go to SoCalOilChange.com. That's SoCalOilChange.com. You are playing to try to qualify for the getaway to Las Vegas at the Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino. Two nights, two tickets to Cool and the Gang, their residency now through 2024. Get your tickets now at Ticketmaster.com. Here are your categories today, Billy, for our musical trivia challenge. Chow time. Eat is the key word there. Light and dark. Those are five songs that include either the word light or dark in the title. And back to school. Uh, those are all songs featured in school subjects. So chow time, light and dark, or back to school. What would you like to play? In honor of the eclipse, we'll do light and dark. All right, and light, we'll give it to Woods, too. Light and dark. Oh. And Woods is getting the category. Oh, Billy is feeling frisky. On a Tuesday. All right, today I have five song titles that include either the word light or the word dark. Uh, 60 seconds. You can pass if you don't know one. First questions are two-second song. Polly, going to play the music. You need to give me the title and the artist. Billy, I know you know how to play. Are you ready to go? Ready. Polly, your ready. status? Ready as well. All right, 60 seconds on the clock. The category, light and dark. Your time begins when Paul plays the music. Good luck, Billy. Let's take on Woods. Light my fire the door. Correct. Future friend star Courtney Cox appears in the music video for which Bruce Springsteen classic? Dancing in the Dark. Correct. Bruce Springsteen wrote which 1973 song that became a much bigger hit when Manfred Mann and his Earth Band covered it in 1977? Blinded by the Light. Correct. Which dance club staple by Madonna was the title track from her seventh album and is influenced by her late 90s study of Eastern mysticism and Kabbalah? Yeah. Which 2013 Katy Perry hit features a trap hip-hop style and rapper Juicy J saying, uh-huh, let's rage over the distinctive opening music? Oh, man. <laughs> they get tougher. I'll have better luck with this Madonna one. Okay. Uh, Dance Club staple by Madonna, the title track from her seventh album, and is influenced by her late 90s study of Eastern mysticism and Kabbalah. Oh, you got a little confident. He did get three, though. Got the first three, Light My Fire by the Doors, Dancing in the Dark, and Blinded by the Light. Ray of Light is the Madonna song. I think that's where it's going to come down to. Yeah, I do, I too. I promise you, Wood's not getting Dark Katy Horse, Perry. you'd know it is the Katy Perry song, and everyone would know it if they heard it, but do they? I didn't know the title of it, and that surprised me as well. I don't think Woods is going to get that one, so I agree. It's going to come down to that song. All right, Billy's score is locked in. Billy. Billy, feeling confident, wants you to know the category today. So, Woods, your category is light and dark. 
Okay. Light and, and dark. Those uh, words will appear in all the song titles. Okay. Light and dark. All right. 60 seconds on the clock. Your time begins when Paul plays the music. Good luck, Woods. Let's take on Billy. The Doors, Light My Fire. Correct. Future Friends star Courtney Cox appears in the music video for which Bruce Springsteen... Dancing in the Dark. Correct. Bruce Springsteen wrote which 1973 song that became a much bigger hit when Manfred Mann and his Earth Band covered it in 1977. Oh, um... Pass. Which dance club staple by Madonna was the title track from her seventh album and is influenced by her late 90s study of Eastern mysticism and Kabbalah? Something light. I know this song. Uh, come back to it. Which 2013 Katy Perry hit features a trap hip hop style and rapper Juicy J saying, uh huh, let's rage over the distinctive opening music? Pass. Go back to it. Bruce other. Springsteen wrote which 1973 song that became a much bigger hit when Manfred Mann and his Earth Band covered it in 1977? I think I'm toast. Uh, it's not blinded by the it light. It is. Oh. Correct. Which dance club staple by Madonna was the title track from the, her seventh album, influenced love, by her late 90s study song. of Eastern mysticism I love and Kabbalah? This song. I love this song. You need it. I love it. You I love it. this song. I love this Quickly. song. Light, 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 light. Mm. Oh. People will come. Ray of Light. Ray of Light. I love that song. Love it. Dark Horse is the tough one by Katy Perry. You You'd know if you hear it. 3-3. Three, three. It's high, which Ooh. is good enough to qualify. Billy, hang on the line. Paul, I'll get your information. You are in I love for the Ray drawing for Las Vegas. So good. It is a good it's Madonna a song. You're correct. Song. Lo- there's like 10 Madonna songs I love. And I promise you'd know Dark Horse if you heard it, but I didn't know the title. I don't know that, that he would. One. Really? You think? I, uh, what sometimes surprises me on... Not a big Katy Perry. I'm how a little big Katy he... Perry fan, actually. <laughs> Her music, I've not... Somehow I she sing fire Maybe it's work. because my kids are older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I I have heard more of these last ten years songs from the pop side than you have. My kids listen to Black Sabbath though. Right. They're six and three. I know. My kids they actually listen to the music of their their generation. last ten years of that generation. So <laughs> right. I've heard some of it at least for a while. All Somebody right. just said I cubs to that one. I did. I cubs to that one. You really cubbed it. I don't want to get too cocky. We need to win today. Win a series. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah, get too cocky. It's long season. I've All got right. a whole bunch of tweets uh, ready to go. For don't do this? No, if oh. they <laughs> if they uh, win today. Yeah, we there probably could be an entire segment of don't do this on people's tweets. I already f- have forgiven everyone. Yeah, everyone's been given a pass. So uh, we won't go that direction on don't do this. I do have an update on, uh, remember Chiefs Burglar? Yeah, yeah, Chiefs burglar. Chiefs burglar. I thought he was in prison. Now. No, not he's. They're still in this, the court case on him, so we can give you an update there. More when we come back with Ben and Woods after a check of traffic here on ninety-seven three. The fan.
get back to our Padres talk. If you want to join us and get online, 833-288-0973. Take some phone calls here after that comeback win last night. Right now, though, it's time for Don't Do This, brought to you by the Craft Taco in Sorrento Valley. The Craft Taco has some of the best quality tacos in all of San Diego. Go to thecrafttaco.com. Take a look at their happy hour specials today, the Craft Taco. Dot com. We got to get Polly out there with us the next time we go. Yeah, it's was, staggering. Were you sick last time? Why did you miss the ta- I think so. tacos? You might have been under the weather. It's staggeringly good. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. <laughs> staggeringly good. I'll start. I don't do this today with an update on Xavier Babudar, better known as Chief Sahalak. He's the Super Chiefs fan who was convicted in a string of bank robberies in uh, Oklahoma and Kansas and is currently sitting in Leavenworth Federal Prison Leavenworth. in Kansas. Wow. A judge uh, yesterday ordered Babadar, Chief Saholic, to pay $10.8 million to a Bixby, Oklahoma teller he threatened with a gun back in December of 2022. So he is facing the music. Now, the attorney for the, for the woman, Frank Frazier, acknowledged it'll be very challenging to collect that money as... But Babadar was unemployed and living in cars at the time of his crime. And I think they already they collected all of his, you know, ill-gotten gains yeah. from the robbery. So he can't use that to pay off the woman. That's not how it works. So, uh, unfortunately, Babadar's attorney, Matthew Merriman, did not respond to a request for comment. And I was really hoping he would. Because if you'll remember when we first brought up this story... Matthew Merriman was the attorney who decided that the best legal strategy to was go to the Scott Boris School of Puns in defending his client. This was uh, Matthew Merriman. the beginning of this case, folks, the government has been blitzing, and Xavier's pocket was collapsing. But today, Xavier stepped into the pressure. He did. He took responsibility for his actions. He stood up. I forgot how much I hated this. I know. Humble and repentant. Repentant. And admitted what he had done. He's repentant. Now, if I know anything about Xavier, and if the Chief's Kingdom knows anything about Chief Saholic, we know that he doesn't give up. We know that if he stumbled and he fell, he didn't let his knee touch the ground. Oh my God. I, I can't. And that's why I'm asking you, good people of this jury, to not put him in prison, but to just give him a two-minute warning. Right. <laughs> yeah. Two-minute warning for for the young man. Jeez, he's uh, again. He's in Leavenworth right now. Leavenworth <laughs> is one of those prisons I've always heard about, and I've scary it sounding. Scares yeah. you. <laughs> Rikers Island. Ooh. Leavenworth. Leavenworth. Alcatraz. Is uh, I've a done the tour of Alcatraz. German mountain town in Washington. Washington yes, where I it's grew not up. where the prison is. It's like, like Kansas. It's like Solvang, <laughs> but in Washington with actual snow. Sometimes. Yeah. Like you, I hear that, and I forget that it's also. a gnarly prison like some really gnarly prison yeah uh speaking of gnarly i don't know if i had a, a match a game and uh, isis threatened uh to do something to it i don't know that i'd be super fired up to play that's exactly what's happening right now european football's governing body uefa said it's been aw- it's aware of a terror threat made regarding this week's champions league quarterfinal uh matches the matches will still go, still go on as planned. They're going to get these games in. Uh, social media posts purporting to be from ISIS suggested it planned to attack the Champions League quarterfinal uh, this week. Ben, so France has, uh, they're going to have 2,000 extra security personnel in Spain. They're going to increase police presence in Paris. Uh, they did say, we are aware of alleged terrorist threats made towards this week's UEFA Champions League matches. We're closely liaising with the authorities at the perspective, the respective venues. All matches are planned to go as head, scheduled with appropriate security arrangements in place. What, would you, Adam says, hey, you got an appearance this weekend at Pep Boys. I mean, Valvoline Instant Oil Change. ISIS said they may be coming through. Am I going? I don't know. I mean, they, they never, they I, never tell you where they're going to hit before they actually hit it. I, the, I think the... If anywhere's actually been threatened, it's probably the safest place on earth. Maybe. It's like a misdirection. Like you it's I mean, you don't say where you're gonna commit a crime before you commit a crime. It's ISIS though. I'm going to rob this bank on Tuesday, just letting everybody know in a tweet beforehand. No mm. one does that. 
Once they've said it, it's pretty much empty threat time, right? I hope so. I, mean, I hope so. Obviously, can't be a comfortable. Uh, hope everybody's safe. Can't but. be a comfortable situation. Well, I hope everybody comes through this. The okay. terror is just threatening just to make yeah. everyone now terrified. nervous and terrified. It's horrible. It's it's awful. But I'm, I'm I'm hopefully they've done their due diligence and everyone will be just fine. Yep. All right, speaking of soccer, little do do this. Oh, and I have a uh, second do do this. Oh, you have a second. DD mega do do. Well, let let me give a do do this to the San Diego Soccers for coming through last night. Not only did they need to win to avoid MASL playoff elimination against the Texas Outlaws at Pachanga Arena, they had to win, and then they had to win a second mini game afterwards, a tiebreaker. They won the first game eight to three, and then they won the second mini game tiebreaker four to nothing, and advanced in the MASL playoffs to the final four. They will take on Chihuahua in another little best of two series. I think. Uh, April 18th at Chihuahua, and then April 21st back at Pechanga Arena uh, as they go for the 18th title, indoor title in San Diego Soccer Club history. Craig had some great calls last night, and I'm sure he'll be in a very good mood when he comes in at 10 a.m. this morning with uh, with Annie for Annie and Elston. And Paul, uh, Paul you have something yeah, else? Yeah, for Do Do This, uh, I think the Do Do This goes to... Let's see, Turb44 in our YouTube chat. He let me know the exact time that if I go to MLB TV, they also do provide, I forgot, they provide the Spanish broadcast in its entirety. Oh, like an alternate channel broadcast. Yes. And he gave me the, in, the exact time to queue up well, Fernando Tatis Jr.'s home run as called by the great Eduardo Ortega. So the Beatles are home. Al Solite. Tatis con un swing le da la vuelta al juego. Al lanzamiento. La prendió por el izquierdo. Vuela la bola. Le va a dar la vuelta. ¡Ta! ¡Ta! Tatis. A la Brilliant. calle. Ahí viene por segunda. Por tercera. El pasito guapachoso. Dando rumbo a home la vuelta. Los padres al comando se van arriba. 9 a 8. ¡Qué juego! No, Unbelievable. Da, da, da. God, he's good. That's my favorite. He's so good. So Thank good. you. Love that you. is yeah, definitely a do do this. Thank you, Tur B, in and the chat. Don't do this on a Tuesday. That was Don't Do This with Ben and Woods on 97.3 The Fan. Now, I want to open the phone lines. Come on, Padres fans. We want to hear from you this morning. 833-288-0973. Give us a call. Your feelings after last night's come from behind win. Uh, just talking some Padres baseball with the great tier ones this morning on Ben and Woods. Be right back with more here on 97.3 The Fan.
I promise. I'm not trying to shame anyone for t- tuning out or leaving early. I'm just curious for people who truly, truly turned the game off last night at 8 nothing. I just want to know how you found out. Like, was it an alert on your phone? Did it not happen until this morning? Did someone call you and wake you up? It, it, to me, it's just a fascinating case study. It's a baseball season. It's 162 games. There are very few people, Woods, who watch every inning of 162 games. If you're not a broadcaster or a player or employed by the team, even the most diehard of fans, you got a wedding. You got something. You have to check your score, your phone, every couple innings for a game. Not everybody watches everything. And if you're going to punt on three or four innings, down 8 nothing in April is a pretty good time to punt on a couple of innings of the baseball season. I couldn't agree more. And I, yesterday was one of those days where I, I was – finding myself going, let's go. What's taking so long to get to 640, right? Like getting the kids home and all that and eating and getting them bathed and everything else. And I'm like, man, I, I, I sat down finally. It was like 430. I'm like, I still got two hours for this game. And then to come out like that, I was on the precipice of just, boop, I'm out of here. But I, I don't know why. Honestly, I stayed up. Um, I took my Ambien pretty early after it was 8 nothing. And I had to fight, fighting through that oh, scene, no. fighting through that scene, like watching that game. No, I don't want to go. Like, oh, oh, no, no, it's do exciting. It. This I don't is so go good. Sleep. And then you're worried after it's over, you know, after it's over, you're like, I can't sleep I've, now. I've never thought of that phenomenon of taking a, a sleeping pill, essentially, and then realizing, I don't want to go to sleep. Yeah. Oh, no, I yeah. don't want to go to sleep. Yeah, it, it was incredible. All right, all right, we've got full phone lines right now, 833-288-0973. We're going to get out to our Tier 1s right after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Traffic is sponsored by Air Max, San Diego's highest-rated heating and air company. Visit them at airmax.com. Got a crash blocking the left lanes on westbound King Freeway just before Federal. Up ahead, another crash right before the 5. That's over the right shoulder. In the North County, westbound 78 before Twin Oaks Valley. We are getting reports of some sort of construction debris in the two right lanes. Looking for the best in HVAC? Choose Air Max, San Diego's highest-rated heating and air company with free diagnostics on all repairs and estimates. See why over 1,300 happy customers have given Air Max five-star Yelp reviews. See Air Max today at airmax.com. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben & Wood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Ropey in the chats has found out this morning hearing Woodsy on YouTube. Like, you turn on the show thinking, oh, these guys are going to light into this team. And oh. you hear just Woods screaming. You saw me tweet show. last night, four play is canceled. I would, there was no way I was going to come in to, today after an eight, at minimum, an 8 nothing loss. At, at the time, it was 8 nothing, right. And I'm like, this is getting worse. There was no way I was going to come in and be like, so, hey, uh, what would you guys think about blah, blah, blah. And I just said, I'm, I'm dropping hammer. You were right, though. Four play was canceled. Four play ended morning. up being canceled uh, anyway, but for a much better reason. Much better reason. I was hot yesterday. All right, let's hot. go out and uh, take some of these calls from the tier ones. Uh, start at the top there with uh, Alec. Good morning. Welcome to Ben and Woods on 97.3 The Fan. Hi, Alec. Morning. How are we? Good, buddy. How you doing? Doing good. I mean, what a game yesterday. Woof. Um,. That wow was that was something, man. First, I want to start off by saying Jackson Merrill, man, what a year he's having coming up. Twenty years old, and he looks like a veteran at the plate. He does. I mean, he might be up there with the Tatis is who I want to see most coming up to the dish. You feel like you're going to get from him a really good AB, you know. And I'm looking right now. It's funny you say that. A guy by the name of Eric Cross. Uh, he is a fantasy baseball writer. Uh, got about 42,000 followers. He's He knows what he's talking about. Posted his sliders, you know, on, on StatCast. Ben, I mean, it's damn near all red. Other than Chase, he still chases a little bit. But other than that, man, like, he's barreling it. His expected well, and, batting average is huge. And you know, I wanted like, to bring up that Chase because he has such good bat-to-ball and hand skills. He had one... Where I think it was in the at bat where he did strike out, um, but he had there was a back foot slider like just devastating. It, no, no way you don't strike out on the pitch, and he swung at it, and somehow he fouled it off. Yes, like how how did you even touch that pitch? He is so good at getting the bat to the ball. Uh, it really is impressive. Uh, Alec, you had another point as well. Yeah, yes. Um, I just want to talk about this win and how big it is for the team. I mean, at the end of the day, it's one win. Uh, it's one game. It's a one-run win. But, I mean, it's so much more. 
This is something that the team's going to hang their hat on, the coaches, the fans, all season long. Circle it, highlight it, star it. We're going to keep coming back and look at this game over and over this season, and I cannot emphasize how big of a win this was for the San Diego Padres. You know, I, I hope, hope so. I hope maybe. so. I hope <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the it definitely hopes so. And you feel – you did feel like a <sighs> – I certainly had it. I, I, we were, we were, we get, hit them pretty good yesterday, and um, you know, Boomer Woods definitely came out. Boy, he jammed it right down my throat, didn't he? Uh, I'll wear it. I don't care. Can Happy. you wear the cleats? The cleats are good now. He can always wear the cleats. It wasn't exactly just him. <laughs> I like, I, but I said I like wins. I, it's hard after <laughs> losses to be like, hey, there's, here's a new belt that I'm selling. You know what I mean? It's tough. It's He's tough. doing it before the game though. Both. And both, and it's not like I said, it ain't just him. Boomer Ro- Woods has turned green in our <laughs> YouTube chat again. Uh, so I will say, you know, and and be a, a, a voice of reason. Of course, in every great season, like the '98 Padres, I remember an early April Steve Finley Grand Slam to win a game. Yeah. Obviously, in 2022, when they went to the NLCS, you had the Jorge Alfaro walk offs early. There are always those games early in the season in memorable great seasons where when you play the highlight reel of the season this is kind of where it started and could this be one of those games absolutely i can see a universe in which you know in november after however the padres however well they do and get to the playoffs and make a run of some sort that we're playing this highlight is like man this was great but there are also teams that have great moments early in the season and go on and, and don't do anything. One hundred percent later it, in the year. It, it's it, just the reality of baseball. It is, and you know. But again, doing something, accomplishing something that you haven't really done as a team together, gives you the the peace of mind to know we can do it. We've done it before. We can do it again. It does. It doesn't guarantee you one damn thing. They could go out and lose seven nothing today because this game is very stupid. It's very very stupid. It doesn't. Doesn't make sense. If and, and honestly, like not to pound like gambling home or anything like that, Ben. But there are times you look at at things in baseball and you go, "Okay, we've got our ace on the mound. They're doing a bullpen day. Feel pretty good about the, the way that the guys are swinging the bats. I'm gonna put a little money on this. Go out and the ace gives up five runs in the first inning. It's just that's this stupid game that we all love so much. There's no rhyme or reason to it, and I don't know. Anyone that tries to prognosticate this game shouldn't last year have taught you that. Shouldn't last year have taught you that you just can't call it. No one had the Diamondbacks and the Rangers, and if you did, said you did, you're probably full of it. No but you can sometimes. That. I mean, you call the Dodgers winning 100 games and winning the division. I mean, if, you're, if you truly take care of business, you can call some things. Very broad strokes, though. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, like, well, very, yeah very broad strokes. Very, like, Will the Dodgers make the playoffs? The answer is yes. Yes. They're going to make the playoffs, right? I mean, other than that, you know, it's... it's I mean, even but, that, well, but, maybe. But here's the thing. Didn't we say that about the Padres last year? I thought of course the Red, they're going to make the playoffs. I, I thought the Red Sox were going to be 0-9. They look really, really good. I mean, they're playing their hearts out right now. They're starting pitch, pitching's good. Their bullpen that was supposed to be a turd, they're pitching yeah. great. Again, I, it's there's early. There's just but, as many surprises as there are sure things in baseball. Yeah, yeah. for C- sure. Occasionally, way the sure more. things come through. Way more. There's yeah. way more surprises than there are sure things. We'll see. Hopefully, there's some pleasant surprises in store as well. Let's go to uh, Nick next up here. On Ben and Woods on 97.3 The Fan. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, fellas. How are you doing? Nicky, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Hey, I'll keep it super brief. I got a couple things. First one, apologize to the YouTube chat for my technical difficulties. That's on me. Not sure what's going on. <laughs> um, I was at the game last night, and a couple things really stood out. The first one was the Cronenworth caught stealing. Yeah. Amaya with an unbelievable pick and throw. I was like, holy smokes, we can't catch a break. And then we got Tyler Wade jumping out of the way of a 2-2 pitch. And I know it's not college ball, but I'm like, dude, we're chasing eight. I need you to wear that ball in the rib. You need to be on. And, you know, I'm sitting, yeah, I'm sitting there going, it's the same old Padres, holy smokes. And then Jake Cronenworth just refusing to quit. That at-bat was so fun to watch. And then he sends it almost to the second deck. Yeah, You could just feel it. You could feel it like, hey, maybe it is different. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, we're only chasing one. The rest is history. 
Yeah, it was awesome. It was an awesome. I'm glad you got to go to that game. Uh, it was it was it was pretty special. But yeah, I mean, again, it 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 means absolutely nothing to today, other than the mood of the team. Let's be honest, the mood of the the city, the mood of the fan base. Everyone is feeling much much better. It's not something that happens all the time. They went out. If they go out and win that game five four, cool. It's awesome, man. We needed to get that dub to be down eight to come back. That's it. Just doesn't happen in baseball all that much. And to tell you the truth. More important than the good feelings of a exciting comeback win, the way that Jake Cronenworth and Jackson Merrill have both looked at the plate, if they hold on to that, that's way more important than one victory in a season. We both said in spring training, two guys who are going to determine a lot of whether the Padres can be successful and surprise some people. They need Jake to well, have a good season. Which, again, I said yesterday, is unfair. It's massively unfair for this fan base to put anything on Jake Cronenworth and Jackson Merrill, who combined make, what, $11 million combined. We have our priorities in the wrong place, I think. And, again, Tyler Wade, you know, Nick, Nick's calling out Tyler, Tyler Wade for not wearing one. I get that. These are not the guys that are supposed to be doing it. They're just not. And, and I'm not going to ride – Eggy Rosario very hard. I'm not going to ride Graham Pauly, who's had 15 ABs very hard. I'm not going to ride Tyler Wade very hard. I, it's Manny, it's Xander, it's Toddy. And two of those three, star, I said last night, Stars got to do star stuff, and they did. But, and that's and we win that ball game because of it. Yeah, true. But what makes baseball so unpredictable is is Jake. What did he do? I mean, he's been working hard the last couple of years, moved his hands a little bit, right. you know, and all of a sudden now he's a – He's back to what he was a couple of years ago. I he hope got that vulnerable. Ho- remember, I, I hope that holds. And and Jackson Merrill, you're not supposed to be able to do this at age 20. He doesn't know that though, so let's not tell him. I'm not going to. Don't worry. <laughs> he, he does not need to know. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. And it's like <laughs> it's it's more 100%. than fair to be skeptical. Like no, that it's not going to hold. That's not going to last. You can't do that at age 20. But he certainly looks like he can right now. That's and, and I really I, I want to make that clear that. You know, I, if somebody makes a bonehead mistake, you know, a Tyler Wade makes a bonehead mistake. Well, that's a bonehead mistake that a guy that hasn't been the, you know, most productive player in his in his career. He's found a way to stick, though, for 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 some reason. He can help you. He can help this team win. In my opinion, he's a really good guy to throw in off the bench in the eighth inning when you need a bag or something. That's fantastic. But getting starts and things like that. That's not on that's not on him, man. That's not that's not his role. So I'm not gonna ride those guys too hard. A lot of guys are playing out of position. Uh, a lot of guys are getting opportunities and they're making the most of them, which is awesome, but it doesn't fall on their shoulder. I also do want to point out that if there is one seed of negativity, the Potters are now getting nothing right now out of their third base offensive slot. Yesterday, all three of them played Wade, Rosario, Pauly, 0 for 4, three strikeouts. I think Pauly popped out on, on his at-bat. After a hot start, Tyler Wade's cooled off. Eggy had the one home run but has done nothing, and Pauly had the one home run and has done nothing else. I don't know. I mean, Manny will be back at third, but th- those guys can't be your DH once Manny is back at third base. I've said this before. No. I will reiterate it. It is right now turning into a black hole. Wherever you put them, ninth, eighth, seventh, doesn't matter. They're not getting anything out of that spot. And to me, AJ has to do something about that position. And it's it's likely going to be DH, and maybe you just be patient until Manny's back because there's no reason to sign a third baseman when you got Manny coming back. But you will need a designated hitter by the end of the month. And I'd hate to lose out on one of the guys who's available. You know, yeah, I think you need to act sooner rather than later there. Yeah, and Pauly needs at bats in the minor leagues. Yeah, it's go, just it's go, not working right now. Go tear it up. You know, go tear it up down there and and uh, I, I, I support that fully. And but again, if you went out and signed Brandon Belt today, what? Where does he play tonight? Not tonight, but when Manny's back, I know exactly right. where he plays. Well, if you sign Tommy Pham today, Jerkson's playing pretty well, you know. So do you? Uh, yeah, you can wait a couple more weeks until but they Manny's may not back. Be there. But they might they might not be they there not either. Because other teams need. Some you could also too. sign someone and give them, you know, a week in the minors to start swinging and and getting into shape for when Manny is back. And he is trending. He was throwing yesterday. Yep. He's throwing from third to first again for the first time since we were back there at spring training for the first couple of days. Yep. Seems like the arms feeling better. 
And, you know, hopefully Manny will be back at third. But when he is, you need one more player on this team. Unless you think it's Jacob Marcy, who is uh, still swinging, and I think pretty well in the minor leagues. But I don't know that you want to make him your designated hitter. Jurickson could do it. I mean, if you if you sign Tommy Pham, yeah. Jurickson could be your DH, and Tommy Pham could play left, or they could split time and left. But to me, you're still one player short here of whatever you're going to be eventually. And I don't know that means you're one player short of winning a World Series. You're one player short of being the most complete version that this team is going to be this season. And whatever the potential is, it's going to be greater with one more player that I think you do need. I know I know, it's still a small sample size, and they want to give some of the young guys a chance, but Tyler Wade's not one of the young guys they want to give a chance. He's not. He's not a prospect. No. Graham Pauly is, but he's not getting a chance. He's he's getting three at-bats a week, maybe. He needs to start playing in the minor leagues every day. It's It's time it's time to make the move, whatever it's going to be. I don't think you're going to regret adding one more bat at this point. I've seen enough. Tommy says move Campy to DH. Well, yeah, then Higgy's catching and also in the lineup I, too. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to see Sullivan up, but again, his numbers in AAA are almost certainly a mirage and not sustainable on the big league level. Yeah. And he's not an everyday catcher either. Correct. Campusano is your everyday catcher. Correct. I would love for him to be able to DH on on the days that he's not catching at least once in a while. But Campy's your catcher. You know, I they need one more player. They do. All right, we'll come back. We got two hours still to go. Jesse Agler is going to be with us. We also are going to give away some uh, Padres tickets to tomorrow's Manny Machado bobblehead giveaway game. Uh, last game of the series against the Cubs. It is all coming up. Do not go anywhere. More Ben and Woods on the way on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fam.
We are halfway home on a Tuesday. Ben and Woods, 97.3. The fan. And uh, great to be here with you. Looks like a beautiful day. I wanted to, uh, you know, I said yesterday, I wasn't super uh, excited. Let me introduce the show. I'm Woodsy. That's Paul Rindle, the executive producer. Ben Higgins, your friendly neighborhood sports anchor. Wanted to get some Eclipse talk going. Because yeah. I went, uh, as I mentioned, in my QC Kinetic spot. I had to drag my ass to choose fitness. I have not been going to the gym. I've been doing little things here and there, but I have not been going to the gym. I've just been tired. I'm just like, blah, blah. And uh, so I dragged my ass there. And I could see some people standing out front looking up. They had the glasses and whatnot. And I just kind of walked past them, went in, got my workout in. And as I walked out, you know, that was that spooky color. Dimmer. Dimmer. Dimmer than yeah, usual. I was, was doing my dog walk, and I, I didn't have the glasses, so I didn't look up. But I could tell it was definitely not the right light level the for, light, for, the for right, 11 a.m. The right hue. I yeah. went to Target after work, <laughs> and when I walked in, I didn't really notice anything. But walking out 20 minutes later, I'm like, like, whoa. Apocalyptic. It's, like, creepy. So when I walked out of the gym, the, the one of the girls that works there goes, hey, do you want to look up? And she had the glasses for all the patrons. I go, oh, that's pretty cool. So I put them on, looked up, and went, oh, all right, very cool. And I gave them back, and I walked back to my car, and I went home. Now, I walked in my room. I had a couple hours to kill before I had to pick up uh, Bo from school. And my room was nice and dark. It was like, every, it was dark. Everything was a little bit darker. And I said, ooh, this makes for a good, good environment for a nap. And uh, so that was my experience. And then when I picked Bo up from school, he got in the car and he had his Eclipse glasses on and was telling me all about it, how cool it was. So it was pretty cool. My parents were in the path of totality and said it was amazing. Said it was just incredible. I saw some of the coverage starting like in Mazatlan, Mexico. And yeah, it they moved had parties north. and stuff. Yeah, People were so, I mean, almost, okay, I, I get it. It's, it's unusual. It's rare. But they were treating it as almost like a religious moment. Like this is this brings the unity that brings us. It was basically, um, you know, shout out to his family. I hope there's peace, yeah, and, peace unity and unity so. that the eclipse brings to everybody in the path of totality. I thought it was a little bit over the top at times. The videos from like the stadiums in the path, like um, yeah. in Cleveland, was awesome. that was really really cool to see. Um, to me, though, here in San Diego, it actually brought back mad, bad memories. Because it felt like when we had all the wildfires and everything was like dim that's how because it, of the that's smoke and everything, yep. it's like, ooh, I remember this. And it was not a good feeling when we had those wildfires. And for like four days, the light level was a little like orange and dim the yeah, whole time. That, it, it felt creepy like that for at least, you know, only like 30 minutes, but definitely noticed a difference. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool. And then... Um, and then it was over and, and, you know, you go around your, your reg regularly scheduled day of waiting for Padres baseball to start at 640. But Paulie, uh, showed us this morning on his phone. Oh my God. This is a, this is to a race that from my memory, bro. This is a nightmare. Paulie said they had a lizard. Uh, in their house last night, and I go, oh, okay. Well, we love lizards. My well, kids love it's lizards. like a gila monster. An yeah. Animals. What did you say? It's like a big dragon, gila monster dragon. I think it's a. Gila monster. Gila monster. It's <laughs> fine. Gila monster. He owes he, us those. We owe. He, he get, when right. he gets a chance get a to get us, he can get it. Like when we drive to Panacey Camp, Gila you ben. go through Gila Ben and yeah. Gila Ben. <laughs> Look at it. He's so excited. <laughs> Listen, turn about his fair play. Sorry. Turn about his fair play, oh, yes. dude. Well, animals. I don't know if it had anything to do with the eclipse, but their their behavior it's is weird, notably right? weird. Like they're off on their rhythms because of an eclipse. They think they start thing? shutting down and then it gets light again. And they, yeah, that's a real, absolutely thing that um, animal behaviorists have studied gets during during eclipses. The light level just messes with them way more than it messes with humans because we can kind of understand what's going on, but they don't. And they they start going into night mode and then they go back into day mode yeah. and it's it's like really weird. So. Well, Dude, this thing like creeped into the house somehow. I don't know if a dog brought it in. I don't know how it got there. But I'm cooking dinner last night in the kitchen. I walk over to the sink and the way our like counter, it goes fridge, sink, uh fridge, dishwasher, sink, oven, kind of all along the wall. And this MFer was like creeping in from like behind the fridge. And he was just walking towards me. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to the sink. And he's right under there. And I'm like, 
ready to vomit because I don't know what it is, man. Like animals like that, uh, little little creatures, little critters that aren't supposed to be I, in your home. I was ready to like, come on, Polly. It's just a lizard. Yeah, we have too. millions of them around. And then he showed me the picture, and it, I go, it's like a cat. Okay, it's this the size one. Of a cat. This like, was ter- this was a terrifying like 14, lizard. 14, 16 inches long. It was huge, <laughs> and the fact that he was just mar- like just marching right towards me with no <laughs> regard whatsoever, and I'm like. No, and I'm like, what do I do? I don't want to like, I don't want to kill it. If I had a shotgun, though, that's what I would just. <laughs> I mean, I, it was. Do you have a p- picture you can post? Uh, I could probably put it up here at some point. Yeah, post um, it in. in the it chat. ended up hiding behind the stove, behind the oven, which I was using. <laughs> so I had to like pull the oven out of its little, you know, cubby into the cupboard or into the countertop. Pulled it out, and he was just creeped up in the corner there, and I had to like <laughs> shove a broom and just kind of he's rolled up, sweep dude, him like out. A, looks like a rattler, man. Yeah, I would have lost. <laughs> it. I mean, everyone remembers my rat story. I had a rat in my house, and I I was ready to burn my house to the ground. Burn it. I went into the bathroom at one point to see if I could locate it, and it had maneuvered up into my towels that were hanging, and then he jumped off of the towels when I ran it. You've never heard a you've never heard a woman scream. <laughs> Like, as loud as I screamed that day. And I had to have a buddy come over and help me get it out of there. Um, I would have... I, it's it. We have lizards around our house, and they're cool. My kids love to, like, look at them and, right. and chase outside. them and stuff. Yeah, outside. And they're outside. all around their school. If a little one got in the house, no big deal. We got three cats. That thing's not going to make it ten minutes. But this thing was not a little lizard. It was a big, big lizard. I think I mean, it might have gotten out of someone's home. And their cage. I thought it, I thought it looked like a rattlesnake it that grew feet. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone. Creepy. You got it out. Got it out. We used. Uh, we have like a little dog gate to keep dogs out of the kitchen or something, and had to just kind of scoop it, move we, it around. We, like, we kind of like made it, it a little walkway from the kitchen <laughs> out the like door, and I just kind of swept it in that direction, and he crawled on outside, and then I just shut the door and was like. I had to recover. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not great with it, lizards and snakes and rats and really any spider, anything. In the house, it's like, just, it's not okay. It's not okay. If I'm on a walk, from out walking outside, oh, I see cool. some lizards. <laughs> no, I mean, you see a rattlesnake, that's still, yeah. like, that's not okay. But, dude, ugh. Ooh. Something about them being in your house when they're not supposed to be is just not good. Mm-mm. Lenny in our YouTube chat says, the eclipse got people horny and other behaviors came out. Weird day in OB for sure. I'm sorry, what? I don't think that, that the eclipse is known to cause those kind of behaviors. Maybe maybe the eclipse caused the Padres to come from behind 8 nothing. Like weird I'm eclipse behaviors in the, yesterday. in the obesians being extra <laughs> horny because it was the eclipse. That is something I would like to discuss further. Is that a real, I hadn't heard a real that. phenomenon? When I went out after the gym and looked at that little sliver, didn't. I didn't, it didn't, Maybe any hornier than I usually am at about eleven thirty. Apparently, in OB, things were going down yesterday during the eclipse. I mean, that's wild. According to Lenny, could have just been because it was a Monday. Like, yeah, just a Monday. You know, long weekend. Things get weird in OB. No, I mean, you know, it's it looks like twilight, so you're thinking, all right, it's time for a cocktail and relax. Yeah, but it's, a, it's like ten thirty in the morning. <laughs> yeah, but you still no. But you're... it looks like it's later in the day, maybe. Mm. All right. Well, whatever floats your boat. Whatever Apparently so. floats your boat. That's all I had, man, for, for foreplay. And foreplay was going to be me screaming at the team. But I didn't uh, didn't have anything to scream about last night. I had something to scream for, but not about. What an epic, epic win uh, last night for the Padres. And now, that best part about baseball, well, the worst part about baseball, great, do it again. <laughs> all right, cool. What have you done for me lately? Jake not- goes 0 for 4 today. He's back to being... You know, yeah, ripped those apart. great wins can't come as infrequently as full solar eclipses because the next one isn't until I think 2044 in the uh, continental <laughs> United States. Yep. So, Padres, we'd like you to win another one like that before 2044, please. Yeah, I mean, look, today would, would be a great day to get your first. I know they won one against the Dodgers and then won one against the Giants after a week in between. I'm not going to count that as a two game winning streak. But this would be a nice time to check that box. You already had the late inning uh, comeback and down eight runs. Done. Grand slam. Grand slam. Check, check. Like, let's let's go out and win a ball game today. I'd like a laugher, if I'm being honest. I'd like a nice 9-3 victory for our San Diego Padres. Yeah, I, I think today important in building off of that momentum. No because question. Because if you, if you simply go out and you lose today. What's it, the RD at right now, Ben? 
what's the RD yeah, at? Yeah, it's run differential. Run differential? Yeah, you should plus know one. We're at plus one. We were at zero going into the game yesterday. Boy, you roll a, a 9-3 victory today. You're a happy camper. Today. Well, and you get back to 500 <laughs> Yeah, if you win today. But then there's also the phenomenon of just every dog has his day. Yep. There will be games like this for the... The A's and they, they, the bad teams will have great days over the course of a baseball season. The trick is turning those days into a streak, into a run, which the team last year, the Padres, were never able to do it. Actually, I was looking at the highlights. The Padres posted a video, the, the first game at Petco Park. Ted Leitner narrated highlights from game one 20 years ago yesterday. And, you know, every dog has his day. Sean Burroughs was the big offensive star of that game. He led off, drove in three runs, including the walk-off single to bring home Khalil Green in a 4-3 win over the San Francisco Giants. Didn't, didn't mean that Sean Burroughs went on to a phenomenal big league career, but, you know, guys have their days, and it happens in baseball. The trick is consistency and turning those days into something more than just one comeback that is remembered as a nice, yeah, that was a fun Unexpected night for the San Diego Padres. Yeah, don't make this the highlight of your season. <laughs> Please don't <laughs> Do make, this make this the highlight, highlight of your season. season. Make this one of many highlights yeah. over the course of a fun season. And and you know, it just it still will not take away from me how special it was. It was special. Last night was a special, special victory. One of you know, one of 162, but a really, really special. It's good to have a highlight though. I mean, I last season. Go back. I mean, what was the highlight? The Fernando stealing home. Yeah, that probably. Was, that was like my, my highlight. That was probably. Garrett Sanchez's grand slam was cool. Uh, but there were no moments really to, to get excited That's about for, for 162 games, to only be able to think of a couple, a couple of special moments like that is I mean, unusually look, small for I'm a baseball back, season. Like Hassan Kim had a walk-off on April that, 3rd. That was the, yeah, Which that was is the, very similar to, I mean, Fernando is, almost had a walk-off. You know, it felt like a walk-off kind of a moment. Uh, didn't David Dahl hit the one right later. before to tie it? Yeah, right. That's how long ago that was. So, you know, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we don't have a repeat of that where it's that's the highlight the first week and a half into your season. That's a good point, Paul, because that happened very early and you thought, oh, just like 2022, it's going to be walk-off city and they're going to have all kinds of moments like they did the year before with Jorge Alfaro and LFGSD and it's just picking up where they left off. And it wasn't like that. Sanchez's Grand Slam didn't come until August 16th. Fernando stole home on August 17th. So we went a good few months in between yeah. significant you can't, moments. You can't let that happen again this year. If you want to have any kind of a decent season, this can't be a one-off cool day and then it's forgotten about immediately. Yeah. It's, got, it's got to be the, the start of something bigger going forward. Got to. Got to, got to, got to. It was, uh, it was special. I loved it. And, yeah, again, great. Now you have to do it again. What have you done for me lately? Go out there and, and, and take it to him again today. Speaking of doing it again, this worked well last week. It ended up uh, getting us Dulap for our first incorporator word. So I want to throw it Love out Doolap. to the tier ones again. Uh, if you're on the YouTube chat and you've got a crazy incorporator idea, or if you want to tweet us at Ben and Woods, submit them now. You've got about 20 minutes before Jesse Agler joins us for the second incorporator of the season. We'll get his thoughts on the comeback last night and getting to call such a, a special game like that. All coming up with Ben and Woods. We'll be back after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan.
in the chat I for see the that. Uh, incorporator. I'm excited by the possibilities for the incorporator coming up. Before the incorporator, in the next few minutes, and someone give me an electric shock if I forget, we will give away Padres tickets for tomorrow's game against the uh, Cubs. It is the Manny Machado bobblehead giveaway, and tickets are still available at Padres.com slash tickets, but you can win a pair coming up here in just a couple of minutes from Ben and Woods and 97.3, the fan. And it's a, uh, what is it, 340 start tomorrow? It's a 707 start today. According to Sam Levitt on the post game show, I heard the end of his post game show last night. A drenched Sam Levitt from the loft at the Western Metal Supply Company building for about an hour and a half going long on the post game show last night. I'm sure he was starting to get pretty cold <laughs> by the end of the night after getting drenched by Manny uh, and just the. Uh, just the, uh, you know, Tatis getting dunked by the Gatorade bath, and he took a lot of it. But 707 first pitch, 607 Eco Water SoCal pregame show. So you're feeling like it's going to be a, a pretty late night again tonight at Penco Park. Ah, oh, there it is. So good. I'm not yeah. sure who the higher pitched. I think it was Tatis. Both, I think both that were Tatis. That was both Tatis. Yeah. The, yeah. Oh, oh, and then, and the... then ah. <laughs> <laughs> It was the first, the big one was for sure Fernando. Yeah. You can like, because I mean Sammy's so close to that mic, it's hot. And yeah, it's hot. If that was Fernando talking to that mic, it would blow in your ears. Yeah, out. no question. <laughs> um, what the hell was I just gonna say? Oh, seven oh seven. Seven oh seven on TBS. Is that right? Yes. Tonight is the TBS I game. I thought we sure. went through this whole rigmarole. We yesterday. talked about we it, but sure. we never actually and looked it up. Somebody, yeah, TBS let me know. game. It is a TBS game. But not on Padres TV, or is it also? I think it's also on just Padres said no TV. on Padres TV. Oh, maybe that means no, also on Padres TV. Then someone <laughs> says Padres. yes. We are dialed in. Yes, it's on Padres TV. Okay, good. The so yes on Padres TV. Yes on Padres yes. TV. Yes on TBS. And TBS Padres TV. Yes, out of market only on TBS. Apparently, no on TBS. I'm going to take a nap unless you're some other part of the country. I'm going to take a nap at five. That's a good plan, actually, <laughs> for you. And that gets you up by 7 for the game. I don't know what time you have dinner. Well, you have dinner at like 3.30. So you'll be a post-dinner nap, then sleep, and then get up and watch the game at 7.07. Margie in the chat says, Woods, why didn't Mike Schilt have Pauly sack Bunt in the bottom of the eighth? No outs, Merrill on first, and Xander on deck. My guess is that Bunting sucks, probably. I think <laughs> that would be because Bunting is terrible. And Grand Pauly's probably not much of a bunter, and he probably didn't want to give away outs with so few remaining. Would be my guess. You're trying to, you're trying to do some damage there, driving those runs. But I, my my general consensus is that bunting is terrible, and you shouldn't do it. Well, they did try the other day with Kyle Higashioka, sure did. and he sure struck did. out, bunting one foul with two strikes. Yeah, terrible. It's swing the bat. It's definitely. Given what, given what the the metrics, given what the saber metrics say about bunting and the value that you're losing, yeah, that it sucks. It's become a part of the game that teams don't focus on that much in practice anymore. Because why would you? Why would you spend a ton of time practicing something that the numbers tell you? If you actually do it, it's lessening your chance to win. Yeah. So <laughs> they don't practice it nearly as much as they used to, which means. When you actually do kind of want one, the guys aren't as good at it anymore. They yeah. just aren't. They're focusing on other parts of their game. They're trying to drive the ball, and they're not practicing a ton of bunting. They do, you know, they still, you'll see them try to lay one or two down, and I don't even know if I see that anymore. Do they always start batting practice with a bunt or two still, or have they kind of even abandoned that practice in the big leagues? I, I don't know that I've seen it. I mean, I still, you know why I still practice bunting? Because I'm a terrible hitter. That's why. That's why I still practice bunting. I can bunt. They cannot. You guys don't. I will. Trust me, if we get up, uh, if it's first and second in the eighth inning and I come up to the plate, nobody out in the Tier 1 game on Sunday, I'm laying it down. I, I mean, I, Why? Because I'm a terrible, unconfident hitter. I'm pretty sure Mike Schilt will still see very rarely there's sure. going to be some value there. You've got, uh, you know, the winning run at second base, nobody out. You want to get them over to third with one out. We did that innings. with Sugar a week ago, and we didn't get them in. You know, it just... Giving away outs, especially that late in the game, just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, 
<laughs> no, nobody says nobody bunts in adult league. You'd be surprised, buddy. They actually do. <laughs> Unconfident. Now, bunting for a base hit is a different That's story. That's a different story entirely. 100%. Third baseman playing way off the line. Boom. Drop it down. Take it. Take Giants it did now. that uh, to good effect against the Padres a couple of Matt times. Matt Carpenter did it to us. It yep. was Cardinals did as well. Yep. It was We beautiful. haven't seen a lot of Padres even attempt, even bunts for base hits so far this season. Padres have plenty of speed in guys who can do it, but doesn't seem like it's a big part of Mike Schilt's philosophy to to employ the bunt. I, maybe once or twice so far this season. I know Higashioka's didn't work out. That's the only one I can remember so far. Swing. So that's that's probably why they don't do that. Yeah. I mean, you're trying at that point, you're down, you're down a run and you you're not playing for a tie. You like you want to win that game. You've battled your ass back. You're trying to win that game. Grand Paulie's going up there. Uh, he's going up there trying to trying to hit a gap there. You know what I mean? That's what he's that's what he's done in his very short uh, big league career. He's trying to do that. That's what he's done in, in the minor leagues. That's what he works on. He's working on trying to barrel a ball into the gap. He's going to come around and score. Let's have a big inning here. Let's try to win this baseball game, not playing for one uh, when you're down one. So I, I have no problem with that. I loved it. And obviously it turned out really, really well. I'm not ever going to be a guy that's going to call for guys to bunt, ever. You know, really. Unless I want for yourself. No, that's me. Yeah, no, no, no. The big leaguers. Me <laughs> bunting extraordinary. Presumably they've gotten to the big leagues because there's something about their hitting history that says they can hit or they wouldn't be there in the first place. I told you guys. Nothing makes me happier than that pat on the ass after just costing my team an out. <laughs> hey, attaboy, Woodsy, way to move him over. <laughs> if you're going to make an out, you might as well get some credit for it, right? When you're walking back hey, to the dugout. Hey, had a kid, unselfish, unselfish. Good job, good job. All right, let's give away these Padres tickets. Uh, call now. Let's give it to the fifth caller, 833-288-0973. Send you to the Padres Cubs game tomorrow for the Manny Machado bobblehead giveaway. First 40,000 fans in attendance will receive a Manny Machado home run bobblehead. And you can get your tickets now at Padres.com slash tickets. And then the Padres are off on the road for a little while after tomorrow's game. Off on Thursday, and then they go up to L.A. to face the Dodgers and then uh, on to Milwaukee, did we decide, is the start of next week, continuing that road trip against the Milwaukee Brewers. All right, we'll come back. Jesse Agler, the voice of the Padres, and the Incorporator will join us. Got to call a fantastic comeback last night. We'll get Jesse's thoughts on it next here on Ben Woods, 97.3 The Fan.
We just mentioned last night was a bit of a late night. Tonight will be once again. So we certainly appreciate Jesse Agler getting up and, you know, got to take care of everything going on at home right now. He is standing by the voice of the Padres. The Incorporator will join us right after this check of traffic on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Still a few things that might slow you down. Crash blocking lanes on westbound King Freeway just before Federal. It's an overturn crash involving a trash truck. Also traveling on the northbound 5 just past Claremont Drive. A collision blocking the slow lane. The Cordell and Cordell traffic cam shows some large debris in middle lanes on southbound 805 just before Murray Ridge. I'm Kelly Danik with Bannon Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Here's the 1-0. and Fernando hits it in the air to deep left. Hap is back at the wall, gonna go! Two run homer, and the Padres lead it, nine to eight. So I know um, Gwen and Chris sometimes play rate the radio call in the afternoons. They do. I wonder, as Jesse Angler joins us for his weekly visit, Jesse, do you ever rate your own calls? Like, do you have your own personal favorites? And do you, like, go back and decide, you know, I love that one. Didn't I could have done better on that one. What did you think of last night's Tatis go-ahead home run call? Oh, man. You know, of course, I think about that stuff far more than I should and very rarely in any sort of positive way. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's just kind of – the nature of my brain, and I mean, it's like maybe twice a year when I walk away from one going, man, I really nailed that. I mean, that just doesn't happen for me. You know, immediately, you know, my thing is like, all right, what what would I have liked to have done differently that time so that I can next time, you know, get it a little bit more right in my own head. But it kind of feels like that never stops. So you're just sort of chasing the carrot, you know, and that's that's how I look at it. But, you know, yesterday it was, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, it was it was stunning. You kind of felt like it was maybe coming, but it was also stunning. And, you know, I wanted to give the crowd a moment there. So there was kind of that pause, you know, after it went over and just sort of let the people who had remained at Petco Park have their moment, you know, to be sort of a part of it and, and cheer and also a moment to just kind of collect myself because it was a, it was a crazy historic thing that we just witnessed. That was so cool. It was so cool. I texted Jesse down for nothing. And I said, man, looks like uh, you can get home Hello? early. I, I'm, are you there? You there? Do we lose you? I hear him. He Did said hello. He I know, like we disappeared. Hello. Are we gonna get the Musgrove music? Jesse. Boy. Are you there? And we lost him. All right. All right. We'll get him back. Stand by. You so you texted Jesse. Yeah. For nothing. And I said, guys looking to get you home early tonight. Get you home from the ballpark. Instead, the exact opposite yeah. happened. A little bit uh, longer. Um, I, I thought the emotion was 10 out of 10. Love, love that call from yeah. Jesse. Yeah. Really, really fantastic. He, okay. uh, he is. Yeah. I think he's too hard on himself. Sometimes Jesse's calls are, are usually top notch almost every single time. And I, you know, the, um, the unexpectedness of it, as Jesse said, so the pitch before, remember, Fernando had gotten backed off yeah. the plate. Yeah, thrown, thrown up and in a little and, bit. And we had seen that before, but you could tell that Fernando kind of knows the, the M.O. Because it happened a lot. What is usually the next pitch after he gets backed off the plate? It's going to be a slider on the outside corner to try to get him a bad swing. We got Jesse back on the line. Jesse, did you kind of notice that as well, that the home run came right after a pitch that backed Fernando Tatis Jr. off the plate? And then he knew that, looked like he knew that outside slider was coming. Yeah, not only that, but I mean, my, my main takeaway from that, and Tony and I talked about it, I don't know if it was in the next inning or later that inning, was how did he not get hit by that pitch? Yes. You know, you talk about game of inches all the time. Cronenworth just missing the home run on, I think, the first pitch of his at-bat and then hits one on the ninth pitch of at-bat, which, you know, that never happens, right? And then, you know, whether it's a defensive play, a little bit of a bang-bang, or the ball just gets under Talkman's glove and right, and then, you know, if Fernando gets hit by that pitch, who knows how that inning unwinds. And I, I think most guys do get hit by that pitch. I mean, the way he sort of, you know, moved his body and contorted himself and made himself smaller at the last second so that that thing whizzed by his hip, you know, was something that not every guy is capable of. And then, of course, he hits the home run. So, I mean, it's just anytime you have a, a regular come from behind win, it feels like there's a thousand things that if one would have gone the other way, you wouldn't have gotten that result. And, of course, 
in a game like last night, that many more things like that. Well, my dumb ass is like, wait, you got to wear that, man. We need you on base. That's that's <laughs> my dumb. I mean, of course, uh, it, it's it would. I it wasn't mad. I was just like, oh man, that's a good chance to get somebody on base. You go ahead, and run. Let's yeah, get you on base. One hundred percent. Let you let you. And do he your almost thing. had that home run. The first he put it on the top of the roof yep. of the Western. Mill. I don't know how far foul it was, but it looked like it was right by the corner there well, of, the, of I, the roof. I texted Jesse last night after they got down four nothing, and just I mean, like Jesse, you agree? Like bad at bats, not competitive competitive at all. I don't know what I think Jake Cronenworth grinding that AB out was obviously the kind of the turning point in the game, but I mean really uncompetitive 2-0 hacks and stuff like that where you're going, okay, all right, I guess we're going to flush this one and move on. And and uh, they ended up keeping you there a little bit longer than uh, you probably thought they would. Yeah, I mean, look, you never anticipate coming back from 8 nothing. It's happened four times in the you know 50-plus year history of this franchise, so you know, you, you don't expect it, but there is always in a comeback that moment where you go, all right, like, let's let's see what happens here. And I'm telling you, when Cronenworth hit that home run, it wasn't the great at bat, although it was a great at bat. And it wasn't the home run itself, which was obviously huge. That kind of like got my brain going in that direction. It was after the home run. Yes. They had a shot of the dugout on TV and it was it was very intense looking down in the dugout. Yeah. And I didn't say anything. It was just kind of something I noticed out of the corner of my eye. And it was, I think, a shot of Cronenworth, and I forget who he was talking to. But you just saw, like, there was none of this, like, hey, we got two, that's nice. They looked dialed in in the dugout. Cronenworth, in particular, was all fired up. He, had lo- he looked to me like he had just hit a game-tying home run, not a home run that made 8 nothing, 8-2. to two. And that kind of got my antenna up a little bit of, like, okay, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe we're going to see something here. And again, you never anticipate coming all the way back from something like that. Um, but there's no question that the intensity dial was turned all the way up at that point in the game. And obviously you need some things to go your way. You need to have the good at bat. You, you, you can have the plan. You can have the mentality. Then you got to go out and do the hard part, which is execute. And, and they certainly did. And I think I said to Tony on the air, after they got the big inning, you know, they were still down. But I said, they've done the hard part. You know, like the, the, now, now it's easy street from here on out. Not to say it's automatic or anything like that, but, you know, they, they had turned what felt like and looked like an insurmountable deficit into something very manageable in the late innings. And what do you know? They went out and did it. And it was Avila, too, uh, leaning over the railing. Yeah. of the of you know the the dugout and banging on the like the side like he was fired up and I said oh that's that's different now you're down six yeah. but hey, it was cool like you're you're absolutely right I know exactly what you're talking about and um, Schilt said the same thing he said guys were coming up saying no we're gonna fight I listen it's all tropes until it's not like it worked they they did it now you got to build off well, of it. one of the unusual things about the comeback though and I could tell you noticed it Jesse is it. It's rare, but it happens where you get back into a game when you're down big. But it's usually a long, drawn-out process. Like two or three rallies, a lot of things have to go right. It was so quick from 8 nothing to feeling like they're right back in the game because it was Jake home run, and it was pitch, pitch, pitch. Bam, 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 and then bam. all of a sudden it's 8-5 to five within like three or four minutes, it seemed like. that It happened so fast, Jesse. Yeah, it did happen fast. And, and the crazy thing about it is, not only did it happen fast, but it happened kind of out of nowhere. Because like you said, they didn't really pose any threat to Assad at all, you know, until the Cronenworth home run. You know, they had the two hits in the second inning. Runners on the corners, I think, won out. They didn't score. And then it was like nothing, 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 nothing. So it sort of lulls you to sleep a little bit, right? You know, and it kind of is like, all right, I guess, as you said, Wazi, I guess it's not happening tonight. And then all of a sudden you blink and it's a one-run or a two-run game. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was a remarkable thing to watch. Look. These are not things we get to see all the time. Yeah. You know, the Camarena game was historic for all kinds of reasons. That was three years ago. You might go another decade without seeing <laughs> you know, them erase a, a, an 8 nothing deficit in the late innings or the mid innings. But, man, it was fun. And I think also exactly what not only the team needed coming off you know, the last two series against the Cardinals and the Giants, but probably a little bit what the fan base needed as well. Um, because while so many things were kind of looking like last year, This does not. You know, this didn't happen last year. Nothing close to this ever happened last year. They came close a bunch of times last year. I don't know how many times I would say going to the eighth or ninth inning, hey, the right guy's coming up, and nothing happened. You know, I stopped saying that at at some point because it was like they just never got over that hump. Yeah. You know, so I think for all of us to see them do this early in the year, I think is really good, you know, for our sanity, if nothing else. 
Jesse Ackler, voice of the Padres, is with us. It's an Incorporator Tuesday. We'll get to that in just a moment. But yesterday was also the 20th anniversary of the first Padres game at Petco Park. You've been around for more than, than half of that. What is Jesse's favorite, maybe lesser known aspect of Petco Park? All the time that you spent there, something that you just you love about the ballpark. Oh man! I mean, uh, how much time do we have? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a couple minutes look, here. So much like of it an is hour obvious. and fourteen. <laughs> so you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good luck to you. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it to me, you know, I got here 2014. The tenth anniversary year was my first year, and it was special. I, I can remember the first time I walked out onto that field. You know, there was a sense of awe, and I still get that, and then some. But While they've done some really wonderful improvements, first it was the video board and obviously just sort of the general maintenance of the place to make it still feel new. I say all the time to people, I go to every ballpark, I'm very lucky, around America. There are places that are not 20 years old that look way older than Petco because of the way this organization has sort of been committed to keeping it looking new and fresh and wonderful. But to me, the biggest difference between then and now are the fans. You know, and, and, and obviously because of the way the team has performed and because of the types of players they have, the atmosphere is so different now than it was then. It was always a beautiful place. We always had the weather. You know, we always had the, not always, but in the last 10 years, we've had the backdrop, you know, of all the buildings. But you didn't have the fan buy-in then that you have now. And I think the biggest difference for me in the 10 years that I've been here is the atmosphere, the noise, the, the engagement of the fans. And it is night and day. It really is. And, and these fans were ready and waiting to have a team that was sort of worthy of that sort of atmosphere. And now that they've had it, you know, they've shown up year after year at this point, And it's just turned it into what was a very wonderful building into one of the best places in baseball. And, you know, the reason that I think the ballpark keeps coming out top of all these lists isn't just because of the setting, isn't just because of how beautiful it is, because that stuff's really always been there. It's because of the atmosphere that's been created by the fans, and and to me, that is what has kind of taken Petco to the next level. It's insane. I mean, it truly, truly is insane to walk through the concourse at Petco Park right now. It's packed. I mean, Monday nights packed. Like it's it's pretty cool. And and if they keep you know if they keep winning baseball games, I think they know. I said it yesterday. This city is begging, begging to love them. Begging. That's all we want. Uh, is a winner, and and we're begging to to love and embrace this team. That was wisdom, though, from Jesse. That was basically the ballpark is an unbelievable canvas, but it's the people, the, the team, and the fans that are the the paint, the art that goes on the canvas, and and ultimately determines whether or not it's a great park or not. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles. If you've got a great atmosphere, that's the most important thing. And Padres have created that with the help of their great fans. And, Jesse, you weren't i mean—you weren't surprised. Some people were streaming for the, the exits, 8 uh, nothing. I, I thought about it. I thought about throwing in the towel. I didn't. I'm glad I stayed up the whole time. But, um, boy, they missed a good one if they did leave. And it, let that be a lesson to them, I guess. I mean, you know, we, we're taking the for the faithful thing pretty literally last night, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's that's who was left, you know, in the eighth inning. And when Fernando hits that home run, the faithful were the ones who were left. And uh, that is, uh, even with a clock in baseball now, there's still no clock. You know, you, you get your 27 outs. You go until you can't go anymore. You know, time, they can't run out the clock on you. You know, you, you can't run out of time in baseball, even with a pitch clock. You still get your 27 outs. Um, and, and if you're able to use all of them, in that way, you create, you know, a lifetime memory, and that's what they did last night. All right, Benny, lay it on him. All right, uh, time for the incorporator. If you've uh, just joined us, Jesse, every Tuesday we'll have to incorporate a strange vocabulary word into the baseball broadcast, one that does not belong. And today's word is contributed by Tier 1 Anthony the Butcher. Just celebrated a birthday, so we thought choose his word that he, that he submitted. It's a very simple definition. Today's word is... Biblioclept. Someone Ooh, who steals. Nice. Oh, like I was a book gonna, I was, oh, yeah. I was, yes, yeah, I was gonna make. Yep. I was gonna make him. He could. I. The etymology. I'm sure Jesse could have figured that out. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Someone who yeah. steals books. Biblioclept. What a great word. Yeah. <laughs> I was a biblioclept a little bit. Were you? Yeah. When I was a kid, like just uh, not a lot returning of library, books. library books. Library yeah. books. I really wanted. Uh, I read. It's called No One Here Gets Out Alive, and it's a biography about Jim Morrison. 
and I loved it so much. Instead of just buying it, I was stole like it. fourteen. I stole it. Wow. I ripped That's when the... teenage rebels are also English majors. Yeah, exactly. That's what I ripped the you know the little barcode. <laughs> I oh, just yeah. ripped the barcode out of the paperback and was like, well, that was the easiest thing I've ever swiped. And uh, that's what I did. I was an actual <laughs> biblioclept. You were trying to break on through to the other side. <laughs> I was. I was. I was. It was. Uh, I tried that many, many years, Jesse, breaking on through. I never actually got through, uh, to be honest. But I, it wasn't for a lack of trying. We, we had the discussion last Wednesday about the different methods that Jesse uses to incorporate the word. <laughs> yes. Which is fascinating. The... The directed conversation, yep. the the crime of opportunity, essentially, when he just kind of jumps in on, uh, you know, something that Tony is saying or the, the conversation goes in a direction. Or the true incorporator, when it actually fits the situation, which is very rare. I don't know how Biblioclept will ever fit the situation tonight. But He'll make it who work. knows? Jesse will find a way to make it work and get that get that word into the broadcast, I have no doubt. We will, uh, we will do our best. Happy birthday to Anthony. That's a great word. And, uh, yeah, tune in to find out. We will, man. Thank you so much. And uh, get some rest. Going to be another long yeah. one tonight. Hopefully another dub. Sounds good to me. Jesse Agler, the voice of the Padres and our incorporator. Uh, yeah, you can tune in tonight, 707 First Pitch, Eco Water Silk Out pregame show with Sam Levitt at 607. It is Joe Musgrove on the mound uh, for the Padres and the Cubs are going again. Uh, what was his name? Brown. He's uh, basically ben, Brown. Ben, ben Brown. Ben Brown, spot starter. Yeah. Uh, don't think he's stretched out enough to go. 11.12 ERA, nearly two whip. Uh, I'm going to choose to believe. I, yeah. I'm not going to say what I want to say. I'm going to choose to to believe. That's what I'm going to do right now. But most of that is one bad outing. He gave up six runs in an inning and two-thirds against the Rangers in his first okay. uh, appearance. He actually threw four innings, three hits, one run against the Rockies his last time out. So he's coming off a better better performance. Uh, speaking of uh, pitching performances, did anyone see Blake Snell? I did. Made his San Francisco Giants debut I did. last night against the Washington Nationals. It was very Snell-like. Snellian in uh in nature. And uh, what was his final line? Three innings, okay. three hits, three runs. Two walks, five strikeouts, 72 pitches, yeah. and he wasn't fully stretched out no. either, so uh, Bob Melvin pulled him at that point. Now, Giants lose? Yeah, they lost 8-1 to one to the uh, the Washington Nationals. And to I, the Nationals? Oof. Yeah, and it wasn't a, wasn't a great game. I mean, I, I saw like one of the runs scored on like a pickoff, and then the runner at third came home, yeah. and the throw was late. I mean, is that, you know, Blake's putting the traffic on, and... You know, he's responsible for that. But remember, all those walks that didn't come around to burn him last year, no guarantee that that will happen the same way for him this season. Uh, Tim Kawakami, who writes about the uh, Bay Area Giants, sports yeah, scene. Bay Area yeah. sports scene, tweeted something last night, and he says, was that a 40-pitch inning for Snell? Something around there excruciating to watch a veteran pitcher just not be able to throw strikes. And Padre fans, I didn't even think they were being mean to him. They just said, hey, man, that's the... That's the full Blake Snell experience. and We he, didn't know when he came over from he the started, Rays either. He started raging on people and blocking them like crazy. Oh, he, I, he's such a blocker. I was like, holy cow. He's blocked cow. me before. So he did? Oh, yeah. Wait, what? I, I don't remember why he unblocked me at some point, but he he is the he is the most li like liberal blocker on Twitter. So Ryan tweets him, has this guy never watched Blake Snell before? He's probably blocked. He tweets this back, the Padre fan rage. I noted that Snell was having a tough time last night. I have watched him do this often before he came a Giant. The Ragers want me not to note it when it happens as a Giant. I'm confused. You're just enraged. Holy smokes, bro. That's Tim. He's not a bad guy. No, but his he social, see, his, his but social media is definitely gets a little chippy at times. How do you tweet that I'm amazed that a veteran could throw 40 pitches in any? It's like, bro, this is standard. Like, you better, you know, what do they have him for a year? Uh, Two at least, years, yeah, yeah. Well, well, at least one, and, and better, maybe more. You better three. dive in, pal. This this is what you get for but especially a while. in April. especially in April that he, he hadn't had the spring training. Yeah, man. Tim. I'll tell you one person who wasn't surprised at all by Blake Snell's performance yesterday, Bob Melvin. Yeah, hundred percent. Not, not at all surprised. I'm sure. Uh, we'll talk about that more. We'll get to the Arundel Report final hour of Ben and Woods coming up next here on 97.3 The Fan.
Benjamin R. Higgins just, just uh, brought up something that I had I'd forgotten about. And there's a couple things to parse out from his tweet last night, Paulie. <laughs> This is the one that he sent us. Yeah. So last night, uh, Ben, 14 hours ago, Ben Higgins, our beloved, tweets. I'm, I'm curious about this. So here's a non-sports poll question. When provided, do you use the sanitary toilet seat cover when in a public or workplace restroom? And then your answers are always or almost always, sometimes never, almost never. And so I, it was an interesting question, to be sure, and one that I hadn't thought of. But the other part that delighted me was that you felt the need to qualify <laughs> to your vast audience. Hey, everybody relax a little. I'm going to do something that's <laughs> not about basketball or being positive about the Padres or whatever. Just want to warn everybody. It's coming. It's coming. I hope everyone felt like they had proper heads up, you know, like here it comes. Don't. Don't freak out. Well, it wasn't like a dirty question. Or, well, it, it was wasn't very like, dirty, actually. Well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like, like, what position do you like? You know what I mean? Visionary. Like, it wasn't. It wasn't anything like that. People were going to get offended by. So, what, first of all, why the qualification? Again, I just felt like I needed to let people know that something unusual was about to occur. So, and out of my comfort zone. All of your tweets are about sports. 90, yeah, like ninety-seven percent are God, sports I wish related. Actually, not. my I'm life, looking right now, my dude. life is ninety-seven percent sports related. <laughs> I know, all my family discussions are generally about sports. Sports related. <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. You can almost. You did have a banger yesterday about the eclipse. I did. I did. That okay. was a non-sports. That's tweet non-sports, as well. but it was a very. Well, I was topical. thinking about Kyrie Irving as I tweeted it. Yes. So it, yeah, that's kind true. Of, that it was <laughs> technically sports related. Sports in I, in there as well. I died. Uh, when I saw that. Like, I would like you to one time send out a tweet like, hey, I just saw the new Godzilla. It was really good. <laughs> you didn't have to qualify. You're That's a well-rounded true. guy. I, thank you. I appreciate that. So, so no, I just, I happen to be, you know, the well-stocked restroom near my office at Channel 10. Yes. Saw that it was there. It didn't look like it had been particularly touched recently. The dispenser with the horseshoe shapes, yeah. <laughs> like tissue <laughs> seat covers. Right. Um, people have names for them that do they? Oh, yeah, they have nicknames for them. People on, on my Twitter said, "Call it what you what you really should call it." I d- I've never heard this. Anymore. They they said, "Call it a ass gasket." Save that, Paul. Just the ass gasket. Okay, I'd never heard that before, and I just wondered, I, I, think who, I just like shorted out. How, how many people are? <laughs> How many people? Butt shield, I see. From, butt shield is good. Is is not bad. I don't know what everyone calls them, but oh wow, they. Uh, I just wondered, like, do people use these? I because I don't really. I don't either. when I'm there. Polly doesn't either. So I, I sent out the poll. We've gotten uh, over 1,100 votes already, and here are the results. Right now, we've got 47 percent for always or almost always use. The sanitary toilet seat cover. Don't lie to me, dude. Okay. The butt shield. Don't lie to me. The ass. Fifteen point three percent say sometimes. What, I mean, what's where's the distinction? Evaluate the situation and decide whether or not it's necessary. No, those people didn't want to admit that they never. And do then thirty seven point seven percent, like you and I, yeah, say and never or almost never. Yeah. Good honest. Uh, good honest salt of the earth people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, colossal waste of time. I will do a, now. When you walk in, you're on you're on a road trip or something. You're like, I got it. And this happens to me. You guys have traveled with me. I, we stop every 30 minutes. So I'll go into some truck stop in the, <laughs> in the middle of Gila Bend. I'm like, I got to go. So I'll run in there and go, oh, no. What happened There's only here? one option. There's, There's one, one option. And one you're like, stall. what happened? I'll do a full wad up on my hand, give it a nice like, wipe, sh- down. wipe down and a shine, and then I'll do my business. But I have never. I don't. I tried it once. Half of it dangles down in the water. It slides around. It's not comfortable. Yeah, it's, it doesn't not, do anything. Yeah, it's not comfortable. It never stays where it's supposed to stay. And I guess my thought is, if people are using the restroom properly, it's really not the least sanitary area. The, your cheeks. The seat. Your cheeks. Yeah. I mean, someone made the point. Your hands are a lot more germ-infested than... Your butt cheeks. No doubt. That's not... Now, if people are not using the restroom properly, I'm not going in there in the first place. I'm just waiting. I'm not like you. I can hold it 
pretty much indefinitely. <laughs> not so me. I am just not yeah. going to use it at all. That's the thing. If, I, that's my qualifier is I try not to go <laughs> ever <in> those <laughs> situations. Like public situations like Me that too. I, I can just hold it until i'm back in my room back at my house wherever we're at what if we're, we're driving road. man i'll wait for a more clean restaurant you or something good. yeah those are good like those drives to arizona like the loves gas stations they keep those pretty clean it's it's a yeah. very it's a pretty even split here though among everybody's usage and what you made a good point you probably should have divided it up between male and female yeah. as well usage yeah for sure but you know i mean everyone has to sit at times so in that sense we're all equal when it comes to the usage of the of the sanitary toilet seat cover every time i've because I, I, I have tried it before and i just feel like half of it's hanging in the water anyway and it just if you had some sort of if it was like a sleeve that you could put around it, it would stay taut. But then, then you I have to really, like, then you gotta, like, then you gotta get, get in there. All I mean, over. exactly have you ever, right. You know, I was trying to put like pillowcases back on my pillows. That's not even easy. Use and your those teeth. are That's clean. The, you hold the pillow in your mouth like this, and then you go ahead and do that on the toilet yeah, seat cover too. Use your cover. teeth. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do with my pillowcases. It is. Uh, it was a good question, and Annie, like Annie, said, Ben, yes, like she was so surprised you would ask. Justin says he puts two down at a time. Nick, I liked. He said, I create my own buffer. He's one of these guys that goes in and decides, I'm going to do an art, a work of art with the toilet paper. Ah. And he builds Lay his own two, little right. Three, all the Bro, way I don't around. have time for this. Like, I'm trying to get in. I'm trying to get out. <laughs> ASAP. You know, it, uh, it was a good question, though. It was a good question. I like where your head was at. Toilet humor. It, it, it wasn't humor. It was actual curiosity. I'm a curious person. Yeah. Uh, somebody says, yeah, if you go in porta potties, yeah, porta pot. That's the last. No, the last resort is a garbage can <laughs> or the side of the road, which I've done. But twice on the way home from Arizona. That's exact. No, <laughs> not on. Oh, no. that, was, that was number one. Why? Right. I had to go number oh, one. Oh, the Kansas. Yeah. The, yeah. Number one. Yeah. Um, porta potty is the last. That's like, I'm, I've, I'm done. I, I have nowhere else to go. This guy said, I work construction, I have a choice. And uh, I, that is one where I, I would learn how to hold it better. Because I've been to Coachella. It's 106 degrees, and there's 75 no. million people there. And you walk in there, you're like, that's it. That's it. I can f I'm inhaling disease into my mouth. I haven't touched <laughs> anything, but I can feel norovirus uh, in this porta potty. Right. Now this is starting to repel people, this conversation. So let's uh, move on to the Rindle Report. And get things started here with our... Edition, today's edition oh, of boy. the Rindle Report. Now tune into the motherfucking greatest. Welcome to the Rindle Report with Paul Rindle. Hi, Paul. All right. Two stories from the world of sports that we haven't gotten to yet. We'll start off in Major League Baseball. And one story that you didn't know you needed. Are you laughing, Biatch? It's the Rindle Report. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Okay, how are you? On 97.3 The Fan. Are you ready to bless the mood? I need some help, please. <laughs> that was good. Can I get a hoi? All right. All right. All right. Good morning, my friends. Good morning. We'll uh, keep it relatively quick here. We'll just do two stories. Uh, I want to start just kind of a follow-up on last night's NCAA championship. UConn beats Purdue. And uh, Dan Hurley, the head coach for the UConn Huskies. Now, four years ago, you may have seen this clip now. Four years ago, I think they missed the tournament entirely. And Dan Hurley, after a loss to Villanova, here's what he had to say. You know, people better get us now. That's all. You better get us now. Because like it, it's coming. Now, calling like your shot like that, here's what's happened since that quote. Well, he's gone 105 and 29 as a head coach. <laughs> he's had four NBA uh, you know, players get drafted in the NBA. His pay has doubled. It's probably going to double again now. He has the best point differential in tournament history. Two two ships. And back-to-back -back yeah. national champions. Get us now. I like that. I can, love that. Can we quote. fully agree that UConn is now undisputedly a blue blood of college basketball? Oh, there was no some question. debate about it earlier. They have more titles than Duke now. Duke has five. UConn wow. has six. Yeah. And so. they also have the most successful women's program yeah. of all time. I mean, so... 
Yeah. Dan Hurley's quoted last night saying, for the last 30, you, 30 years, UConn's been running college basketball. He yeah. didn't say men's basketball, women's basketball. Yeah. I mean, 95, the women won it. 99, the men won it. 2000, the women. 2002, 2003, all women's championships. 2004, they both won the championship. 2009 and 10, the women's were champions. 2011, the men won it again. 2013, the women. Like It's just back and forth. They have dominated the sport. That's pretty cool. UCLA still has the most, but only one of those has come in the last 50 years. The John so, Wooden era. Yeah, those are all from the Wooden era. If we're talking actual modern basketball. What was you, the Wooden? Like, it was like 9 and 11 years or something? Yeah, 60s into the 70s, and they won, <laughs> what, 10? Yeah, and like 10 incredible. out of 12 And then they had the one where Jim Herrick and Tyus Edney and, and yeah, great run. Through the Herrick tournament, Rhode Island guy. They get him from Rhode Island, or he go. To I think Rhode he went Island. to Rhode he Island to Rhode later Island. after yeah. things soured a little bit. But yeah, th- that's not. I mean, they're not even the best program in California anymore. Right, we are. Here. <laughs> I yeah. just love yeah. that quote from Dan Hurley <laughs> four years ago. Better get us now because it's coming. That's pretty. That's you've pretty heard. Rad. You've heard. You know, coaches have said something along those lines in the past. Rarely do they follow I think, up. Uh, like Andy that. Green said it. Andy Green was one of those coaches that said. He had a big speech like that, remember? I feel like every Padres manager probably said it. Dan something. Campbell had the greatest of all time. Yeah. yeah bite your kneecaps. Gonna, hey, we, you know, if they're going to knock us down, we're going to bite your kneecaps. We're going to get back up. And UConn's done some kneecap biting. And now they're just behemoths that look completely unstoppable. And uh, finally, we were talking, I think, last hour. Woodsy, you, uh, you were actually a little excited to go watch the Eclipse last night. Or yesterday morning. But I wasn't, and then I got excited when once I actually you started, saw it. Once you were actually out I was there. like, oh, right. cool. Now, I don't know if you were as excited as, uh, this is Stephanie Abrams, who is a meteorologist for the Weather Channel. I believe they had her uh, out there on the East Coast where you did get the total, total darkness, like totality. And this is as the moon and the sun are crossing paths. This was broadcast on the Weather Channel, and she uh, really... Got into it. Got into it. Come on. We've got four minutes. Texas. The crowd Texas. is willing it. Yeah. Oh. complete darkness sounds like hotel hannah it's um joking now the rarity of it is certainly notable but (laughs) this is well it's like i mean if if you went to a sporting event and as exciting as like fernando tatis jr's home run was going to be if you knew it was already in the script like (laughs) Like they told you 27 years ago (laughs) hey i'm looking at the charts and on april 8th of 2024, Fernando Tatis Jr. is going to hit a two-run home run in the bottom of the eighth inning, and the Padres are going to win that game. It would still be very cool to watch, but that wouldn't be my reaction necessarily if I knew it was coming. The Eclipse, there was, she was acting as though like it was in doubt at the last minute. Is it going to happen made or it. not? We made is it. it going to happen? It did! Just I can't for believe it! Just for a second, but I'll take it! I will take it! Look at it! Oh my God! Look at it! Oh my God! <laughs> She's lost her mind. She lost her mind. Astronomers can tell you, like, until the end of time, every single (laughs) eclipse, it's going to happen exactly the moment it's going to (laughs) happen. That's so good, dude. Oh, man. Mm. I saw, like, meteorologists or weather uh, news people that were on remote throughout the country. Like, some people were crying. It was emotional. Very weird. Tyler said it was cool. They didn't have a clear view. It was very cloudy. And then right at totality, the clouds moved away. So maybe that's why she was so excited. I I will die, guys. (laughs) That was. I mean, incredible. if you were in the path where it did get completely dark, like I could just picture it being extremely cool. I don't know that it would move me to tears or yeah. whatever was happening yeah. with uh, this I mean, woman in Texas. It does get dark every day, everywhere. The just not at that time. The said, "Well, imagine being an expert in your field and seeing something that will only happen once in a lifetime." That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. That is like their Super Bowl. I guess. If, I guess if Tatis was only going to hit the one home run, yeah. and even if we knew it would be coming, it that would was, be very exciting. That was our World Series. That, that's true. Is that it? 
That's it. All right. Tough to deuce on us today. I had to keep it short. Keep for time. it short. Got it. I'll get you. Still All no right. Morgan Wallen, huh? I've been. I put it in for don't do this. I don't know why you didn't do it. I forgot. On the what did he do? He threw a chair off of a roof, intoxicated, almost hit a couple cops. That did, bad. That was that like bad. 17th floor? Sixth floor. Oh. 17th would have been way worse. Sixth is, six six is, is high. higher than you think. We're oh. on sixth, fellas. Look outside. <laughs> Does it really make a difference whether it's the sixth you or the seventh? You can the seventh. No. Right. No. Once you're, uh, if you throw it off the second floor and you can see no one's there, right. it's damage, but it's not necessarily potentially deadly. Like third or third floor, I you, think. You throw something on six. You throw out something out this window, it lands on someone, they're dead. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah. It's yeah. That is bad. Don't do this. Don't do this. All right, we'll come back. Uh, we've got some more tickets to give away. This time for the uh, the San Diego Legion. Chance to head out to Snapdragon Stadium. We also, Benjamin, need to talk about perhaps the biggest story in baseball. The one that uh, we really don't want to talk about. But we have to talk about it. Try to get to the bottom. Of, I would love to talk about it. Of actually. what's going on. I don't understand Can't... some of the logic in the argument here that's been going around the last few days there's, in there's particular. Arguments. I mean, it is a huge, huge story in baseball. Like we're not right putting the blame in the right places. Right. All right. But. We'll get to that coming up uh, next with Ben Woods after a check of traffic here on 97.3 The Fan.
So, yeah, big topic in baseball that we haven't addressed yet, but has certainly been discussed now nationally extensively the last uh, couple of days, especially with the, the Spencer Strider injury, Shane Bieber going to get Tommy John surgery, Yuri Perez, Tommy John surgery, great young pitcher for the Marlins. The pitching injuries. Framer Valdez, they just said That's right. yesterday. He, he, got, he got pulled, pulled a scratch scratched. from his start. The pitching injuries are an epidemic in baseball. But the question is, is it different than it was before? And if so, what is causing it? And the players' union came out with a statement complaining about the pitch clock and, and subtracting two more seconds off when runners were on base this offseason, kind of implying that, oh, I mean, you want safety for your pitchers, yet you're doing this, you're taking these steps and changing these rules that are taxing the pitchers more. Why would you do that if you claim to have – pitcher health and safety as a priority and major league baseball kind of clapped back and says well we've done a study and they're not it's not showing anything yet i mean it's not complete but we're not seeing any you know increase injuries correlating to the pitch clock and no one knows entirely for sure what's going on here but it's become a pretty contentious argument between baseball and players here, about these pitching injuries here we go again right and uh tony clark's MLBPA put out, uh, despite unanimous player opposition and significant concerns regarding health and safety, the commissioner's office reduced the length of the pitch clock last December, just one season removed from imposing the most significant rule change in decades. Since then, our concerns about the health impacts of reduced recovery time have only intensified. Their unwillingness to acknowledge or study the effects of these profound changes is an unprecedented threat to our game and its most valuable asset, and the players. And, you know, Jeff Passett came out and was like, well, listen, you know, we don't need this is not we don't need a time of dissension right now. We need we need everyone working together. Garrett Cole came out, said he was disheartened by Major League Baseball's response. Uh, he said he said. There's multiple contributing factors to the rise of arm, arm injuries like maximum velo and spin. And I have some ideas, some thoughts based on all the stuff I listen to, the players that they talk to. Um, the weird thing about this, Ben, is that I think we're past the I think we're past the point of no return. And that's an odd feeling to be at. Usually when you're like, hey, something's going wrong, let's address it, let's fix it. It's so it reaches so far down below Major League Baseball that I don't know that you can ever accurately fix it. One of the things that they talk about a lot is um, the travel ball scenario where kids are playing year round that's baseball. My, that's where I would say is probably the most blame should be put. They're not developed yet, but they're throwing a ton and they're throwing high stress. They're not. Throwing with their buddies, long toss. We used to do long toss like madman. I feel like it helped me throw better. And um, the Japanese culture, they really believe in throwing a lot. And but the ligaments in your elbow, they take, they have to grow when with your body. And you're when you're stressing so much, and you're doing it 365 days a year. You're seeing kids getting TJs in high school and stuff, and that's no good. The other, the list of things that they're blaming, pitch clock is one of them, right? Um, the ball, the ball itself is one that Tyler Glass now said 100% is why I got hurt. I was chasing a Cy Young. I was probably going to win the Cy Young. They changed the baseball. So now he goes, by the way, all of your favorite pitchers use something to put on the ball. And it's not for, it wasn't spider tack to spin it at 3,500 RPMs, Ben. It was for grip. We've all felt the Major League Baseballs, they feel like this, this lacrosse ball that I'm holding in my hand. They're they're really, really slick. So just to hold it, and i got to be able to spin it, I need something. I need a tackier baseball. He said it wrecked his, his elbow, his UCL, all that. So there's all these different reasons for why it's happening. But the problem is why I say we're, we've reached the point of no return. What are you going to do? You're not going to ban travel ball teams. You're not going to ban – you know, kids chasing velo, which is, you know, like Kyle Bodie is not going to come on and say, like, he's telling you, I'm teaching you how to properly train for velo, right? And it's worked for a lot of his guys. A lot of his guys have gone on to great success chasing velo, and they've made names for themselves. Um, 
I have a, an interesting theory, too, of why guys chase velo and why guys chase spin. You know why? Because they want to get paid. They want to make money. Of course. And so I watched the other day. I told this to the guys in the dugout. I saw – and I'm, I'm – Please don't get your panties in a bunch. I'm not it, every team does it, Dodger fans. I just saw the last couple of days. The Dodgers called up Nabil Krismat. He threw one game, they sent him down. They called up Denelson Lamet. He was there for three games. I think he pitched in one. They they sent him down. They DFA'd him. If you're a pitcher, knowing I'm gonna get treated like basically a piece of meat, right? I'm transactional. Why wouldn't you go max effort every time to try to get outs? Why wouldn't you go max effort your entire life to try to be the guy that they can count on, the guy that they're willing to stroke a check to for five years and you're a valuable part of this team? I can make life-changing money. There's a lot of people out there right now going, well, back in the day, they knew how to save something in reserve. If you save something in reserve right now, if you're coming out, if you top out at 98, but you're throwing 91 and 92 in the early innings and you, you're not locating it well, you're going to get hammered. And you're going to be out of the game. So it's this vicious circle. I, I've got some thoughts, and I will share them. I will tell you what doctors say that they believe is the biggest cause of the pitching injury epidemic in Major League Baseball. And we'll do that when we come back. First, I've got some uh, tickets to give away to the San Diego Legion. They're going to be playing on Sunday against the NOLA Gold at Snapdragon Stadium. You can get your tickets at sdlegion.com or win them right now. Call 833-288-0973. Third caller gets a pair of tickets to Sunday's San Diego Legion rugby match against the NOLA Gold. 833-288-0973. There's no, there's no 100% answer, but doctors will tell you with pretty l large degree of confidence what they think most of these injuries, the UCL injuries, are caused by. We'll get to that coming up next on 97.3 The Fan.
You can uh, add another one, Ben, to the list of injured pitchers. Boston Red Sox starter Nick Pavetta just went on the 15-day IL with a strained elbow. So, yeah, this this rash of injuries has been pretty insane uh, so far this year. And you're talking about some of the biggest guys Biggest guys in in baseball, you know, with it's with, almost a conspiracy level, right? At yeah, this point. With, with Shane Bieber, uh, of course, with Spencer Strider, and they're you know that's still up in the air. They're still trying to figure out the options for him. Um, you know, Garrett Cole's coming back, supposed to be back in in June, not having surgery though, so it is it's dicey. You know, uh, Joe Sheehan, baseball writer who uh, smart you know, we, we've had on before, a smart dude. He tweeted a couple of things. I want to read one of his tweets. He said, "Overuse." isn't part of the equation at all. When I started doing this 30 years ago, teams would routinely break pitchers through overuse. Think of uh, Dusty Baker. Kerry Wood, Mark Pryor. Yeah, but that quite literally never happens anymore. Completely eliminated. Teams, through, you know, knowledge and experience and basically understanding, you know, pitch limits, pitch counts, inning limits, taking, you know, care of young arms, they don't overuse them anymore. It's very, very rare. They're babied a lot They're, now. So they, yeah. And that is not now why pitchers get hurt. Now, maybe some of it in terms of growing up, the, the extra usage they're getting on travel ball teams could be contributing to it. But Major League Baseball teams don't have that problem anymore. They are all careful to almost a fault with some of their young pitchers. I'm going to check traffic. When we come back, I will tell you what doctors I have heard say is truly the the cause for these pitching injuries next here on 97.3 The Fan. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Traffic is sponsored by Air Max, San Diego's highest rated heating and air company. Visit them at airmax.com. Got a few problems wrapping up our morning drive. Collision involving several vehicles, including a big rig, South 163, past Friars Road. Everything's in the center divide. Also traveling on westbound 54, right before National City Boulevard. There's a collision over the right shoulder. Northbound side of the 805, past La Jolla Village Drive. Got a stalled minivan in the center divide. On the coastline, southbound 5, right before Palomar Airport Road. Reports of a wood pallet in the slow lane. Looking for the best in HVAC? Choose Air Max, San Diego's highest rated heating and air company with free diagnostics on all repairs and estimates. See why over 1,300 happy customers have given Air Max five-star Yelp reviews. See Air Max today at airmax.com. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Now keep in mind, pitching injuries are not are not new. Nope. They have been going on since uh, Major League Baseball really started. And the reason why you hear about them more nowadays is uh, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, players are making so much money when all of a sudden they're not available and they're on the injured list and there's so much more media coverage. You talk about it a lot. But back in the old days, before they invented Tommy John surgery, pitcher would get hurt and you just never hear from him again. Yeah. They'd just be gone and they'd just bring someone else up and they'd start pitching. You know, Sandy Koufax, his career ended because, well, you know, he got hurt. And, you know, he was kind of the most famous. And then Tommy John surgery was invented. And I heard my grandfather talking about this more than 30 years ago. And and my grandfather actually has a good opinion on this because he was Dr. Robert Curlin, who invented Tommy John surgery with his partner, Frank Job. So they studied elbows a lot you Does know he really know what he's talking so about he, uh, this is more, <laughs> like more than just you know your general uncle who's a baseball fan actually had a knowledgeable opinion and i i heard him talking about this and now it's an even bigger deal because as we have gotten more knowledgeable about training techniques and building up muscles and ways i mean athletes now are bigger stronger faster than ever does anyone disagree with that no Athletes are getting better, including pitchers who have stronger arms, and they build up the muscles, and they know exactly how to maximize the usage of those muscles. And in in many ways, they also know how to keep those muscles from getting hurt better than ever. However, you can do nothing to strengthen a ligament. Right. It is the one you're given with, that you're born with, and there's nothing you can do to make it stronger. So as your muscles... And get stronger. And you're putting more and more stress and torque and throwing the ball harder. The max velo, as you said, Woods. It There's nothing that your ligament can do to offset that. So as pitchers have developed faster fastballs and more break and more spin on their sliders, there's nothing that the ligament can do to keep up with the advances in training 
and technology and everything else that has made pitching so much better nowadays, and the ligament can never keep up. And so you see more and more ligament injuries because they've gotten so good at identifying how to throw faster and how to throw spinnier and make it more difficult for the batters to hit the ball. It's also doing this irreparable damage to their elbows. Uh, it, it's it's absolutely true. Chasing spin, chasing velo, certainly, uh, if your ligaments aren't developed. It, but how do you, if you're a high school kid, right, and you're pitching – at uh, Granite Hills or something, right? How do you get noticed? It ain't by throwing 81 and dotting the corners. By throwing 91. It's by throwing 91 and then 94 your sophomore year, then 96 your junior year. And mm-hmm. next thing you know, you're playing at Vanderbilt and you get drafted after the first round and you're you're on your way. But your arm could be in tatters because you're overused up to that point. Then you get to college and they're, they're going to use you if you throw that hard. Um, and now you're going to start chasing spin because we want guys that can spin it. And we want guys that can throw the nasty sweeper, the nasty slider. And we need we need a bunch of torque and we need a bunch of RPMs. That's how you get paid, <laughs> right? Like, I, And everyone always likes to use the example. What about Nolan Ryan? He pitched 20 years. Great. What about Tony Gwynn? You're talking about unicorns. You're talking about for every Tony Gwynn, there's a billion guys that couldn't do what he does for every Nolan Ryan. You're talking about another billion guys that probably threw pretty hard and knew how to pitch. They didn't make it because they got hurt. Take the unicorns out of it. Talk about the every man. Talk about the, the guys that are, are, you know, more down to the mean, essentially. Here's my prediction going forward. And this is what could start changing things right now. Pitchers, as you said, They have all the incentive in the world to throw as hard as they can and spin it as much as they can until they get what? Big contract and get those guaranteed deals and get that money. And guess what? Even if they get Tommy John surgery, they're still getting paid. You know, the longer the deal, the better. But we're starting to see it. We saw it like with Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery this offseason. The pitching position in Major League Baseball is going to start going the way of the running back. In the NFL. It's not going to go away. Still going to be very important, very oh, yeah. valuable to the game. But teams are going to stop paying as much for pitchers because they know they just won't last. Just like running backs won't last that long, pitchers won't last that long. And the days of you know that $325 million contract for Yoshinobu Yamamoto, maybe the Dodgers can afford it. But most teams can't, and they won't and they give won't. that out anymore. Yeah, they won't. They, they won't. will not give those contracts to pitchers anymore. And that's when truly you may start seeing some behavioral changes from pitchers going, if I can't get that big contract by throwing 100 and spinning everything, pitch. I better learn how to stay healthy because that's what's going to be the most valuable commodity <laughs> going forward and it's going to drive prices back up a little bit. But that's going to be a really slow process because right now pitchers have all the incentive in the world to shred their elbow to the absolute limit until they get their money, and then it's guaranteed, and then they can get the Tommy John surgery and hopefully come back and get paid while they're rehabbing. And there's really nothing that's going to change it. And I, you know, Joe Sheehan did tweet also about, he said, no, no, this is his, his opinion, but he says, why MLB pitchers blow out their elbows in 2024? Max effort pitching, 65%. Workload, usage, effort is amateurs, 18%. Stuff we don't know yet, 14%. Pitch clock, less recovery, 3%. He thinks it's a very small, small part of the equation. Now, is it something that you should be looking at and taking seriously? Of course. You can't just dismiss and say, you know, there there can be no pitch clock because pitchers get hurt. Well, if there was no pitch clock and literally the umpires, you could take as long as you wanted – Pitcher should sit there like 20 minutes between pitches and recover as <laughs> get, long as he can and then uh, throw another 105 and then we'll wait another 20 minutes and we'll throw another pitch. There has to be some sort of rule as to when you throw a pitch. And they've, they've put it at 18 seconds and 15 seconds. If you want to tinker with that a little bit, fine. But you can't just say no more pitch clocks because really the, the, the best thing for a pitcher to do would be like throw a pitch every hour. And throw it as hard as you can, and then let's wait and recover as long as we can, and then throw that'd another be, pitch in an hour. Be super fun <laughs> to cover. Ball. Uh, All right. Let's wait. Wait for him to recharge the old battery and recharge the old Does engine. Does a little walk around the mound. You can't just say there can't be a pitch clock. So I, I did not like it, and I said it when it happened. I didn't like the 
You just put the pitch clock in. Stop messing with it. They finally just got used to it. Now you're speeding it up more. That was dumb. That was dumb. And and now it's in these guys' heads. You I know. think the games are moving along just perfect they, right now. Fun, I thought they, they I thought last, last year, year the That's twenty I thought twenty seconds with the guy on base felt a little long. It was like ah. it was dragging. It was, it was the, not dragging. It was the hitters that were making it drag. It was the Trent Grishams who would like yeah. jump out of the box for twelve seconds, then jump right in at eight. We didn't need that. Get those guys in the box like you did on every other pitch. All of a sudden, there's a guy on base, and the the hitter is now just sitting around doing nothing. Pitchers have longer when guys are on base. You're not you didn't really decrease anything. You still have 15 when they're not on, when there's nobody on base. Nothing yeah, has changed true. there. You have more when they're on base. You're really speeding up the hitters with that lowering of the pitch clock, not the pitchers. They have their pace. If they continue to pitch at their pace, one pitch every 15 seconds, nothing has really changed for the pitchers. It's the hitters that they change the rule for, in my mind. So I don't I don't think that the two seconds there's no way that the two seconds has caused 17 right. pitching injuries in the last two weeks. There's, there's no way that's possible. Not at all. Now, the overall effect of the pitch clock, the guys who came up with the minors pitching more than they were used to, yeah, that, that could be part of the factor. But this two-second thing has nothing to do with it at all. Nothing it's to like, do with it. It's like Paul Skeens right now, who's just shoving down in the minor leagues for the Pittsburgh Pirates. If you're the Pirates... And he's throwing 103, but he's throwing it down in the minor leagues. And the Pirates are like, you want to win? It's you're just it's a ticking time bomb. You're waiting. So might as well use those bullets at the big league level. Problem is they don't want to pay him like a big leaguer. They're going to keep him down there till he inevitably, inevitably says, I've got elbow trouble. Get your TJ. Come on back. It's 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 part of it's almost a part of a process of a young player now. It's part of their progression. Their yeah. progression. Like are you gonna get your T oh I got my TJ Oh, senior, you've only had one senior year in high <laughs> yeah, school. Who's gonna be is there there's who's a guy be the first to get for three? Is there's there a, a guy third? I just saw a guy had a, a guy, I can't remember who it was, had two. Uh I think he was a White Sox pitcher, two, and they're like Part of the problem is you got to find that ligament from somewhere. And I know they're starting to use like cadaver ligaments because they take them from different parts of your body. Yeah. You've only got so many to donate to yourself, to your elbow, before you run out of other ligaments I that mean, you can give up in your body. It's also funny because guys worked quick before the pitch clock. There were guys, there was guys that dragged and there were guys that worked fast. You healthy know, guys. You know, healthy fast. guys that work fast. Absolutely. They get the ball, they throw the ball. Um, it wasn't It wasn't really an issue then. Now, so I, I don't know. I mean, look, one thing, can we all agree on this? And it should have been done a long time ago. Can we all agree that Major League Baseball needs to fix its baseball? It's it's every year. The hitters are complaining, and now the pitchers are complaining. No one's happy. The pitchers need something with a little bit of tack to it, a little. And the pit, uh, the hitters need to hit something that doesn't feel like, you know, an old ball filled with sawdust. Like, there has to be a happy medium getting one uniform baseball for these guys that the pitchers are happy with and the hitters. Guy the other day came out of the game and he said, write it down. Those balls were horrible. They were terrible. You can check it off. These balls are dog ass. I mean, so this has been an issue now for the last three, four seasons. Find a ball that has a little tack to it uh, or let guys put a little tack on it. Do you know what I'm saying? Without doing the spider tack that they can now spin it at 4,000 RPMs come to an agreement on a universal ball like they do in golf, like they do in other sports. And so that's something that I think could help. You yeah. know, you're trying to grip and rip these things that are cue balls. You have to spin it so you can be effective, and you have to go max effort so you can be effective. I understand. I understand why guys tr – blow out their arms trying to get to the big leagues. I absolutely do. And, and you forget about the success stories. Lance points it out in the YouTube chat. Blake Snell was a human rain delay before the pitch clock. Yeah, I want to Guess Cy what? Young. They put it in a pitch clock. He won a Cy Young Award last year, uh, throwing with good pace and keeping it going. They well, do it. They do adjust. The thing, there's no doubt about that. And the thing, too, I saw somebody made the point the other day. This is why the biomechanics lab is – is a good thing. You know, those guys with Ruben, I, I don't know that they're in there. They're chasing. It's a good thing, but it doesn't help your ligament at all. No, it, but it helps it, your mechanics. It helps your mechanics, which can, yeah, which can which help good. take. But, you know, like, again, like, I've heard other doctors say 95 was pretty much the limit of the human body. And once guys started consistently throwing harder than that, it's game over for the ligament. It's that that's well, you I know. mean, look at Araldis Chapman. He's throwing a hundred and he's thrown a hundred and five miles an hour. Uh, He's had it. He's had TJ though. I think he has yeah. had TJ once. Man, 
I mean, again, you're talking about a freak. These some of these guys are just freaks of nature, and you're trying to you're trying to keep it fair between the hitters and the pitchers. But it's not fair if the pitchers keep going down, down, down. And uh, so I, I don't know the the answer. I do know as a parent, you know, look, there's nothing my child is on fire more for than baseball. He's on fire. He plays every night. We play every he, in, by hit. I'm not. It's not me going. Let's go. Let's get some throws. Like he's psychotic about it. What am I going to do when he comes to me and says, "Dad, I want to play. I want to play with my friends on this." Select team. I want to play year round. I want to go to Riverside. What am I going to say? I mean, you could play baseball. You just take it easy on the pitching. Well, that's the thing. If he's even a pitcher, but he's gonna he want he's gonna be throwing all the time, always. So, but he also likes other sports. I'm going to gently nudge him into lacrosse and basketball and some uh, golf, other things. Try to do that seasonal thing. But I know him. He's going to want to be on the best team, winning baseball games. It's a quandary. It's a quandary that I think a lot of parents are in right now as well. Uh, curious to hear the uh, thoughts, Annie and Elston, coming up here at the top of the hour. Plus, get a whole fresh perspective on last night's comeback win as the Padres beat the Chicago Cubs 9-8 to after trailing 8 to nothing. Uh, you'll get more from Annie and Elston coming up here. Uh, Padres back in action tonight, 7.07. Remember, later first pitch. Woods is going to try to take a nap and then get yeah, up get nap and then for the, the game. game. <laughs> uh, Sam's got your Eco Water SoCal pregame show at 6.07 tonight. And then we got the 340 game tomorrow with the Manny Machado bobblehead giveaway. And then the Padres uh, hit their first kind of real road trip, not just a three gamer to San Francisco, but they got LA and uh, Milwaukee coming up on their next road trip. Is it a three city road trip on the next one? And then, or just the two? Just the two city road trip. They're going to be staying at Blue the Jays. Fister. At the Fister yeah. in, in Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah the Can't haunted. I uh, love Fister haunted stories. Hotel. But yeah. uh, we will be back uh, tomorrow morning. At 6 a.m., uh, hopefully talking about a second straight victory. Two wins in two days have been difficult to come by for your San Diego Padres this season. Yeah, and about for about a season and a half. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they got two and three sometimes last year. Yeah. Sometimes. Let's start with two this year and it. go from there. All right, that's it for today's show. Tier 1s, you are outstanding. Thanks for getting up early. I know everyone was excited after what happened last night. Uh, hopefully we'll all be just as enthusiastic tomorrow morning. Paul Rindel is our executive producer and imaging director. Great job, as always, for Stephen Woods. I'm Ben Higgins. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. From all of us at San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. So long, everybody.